this this session and uh, this is a year-long conference in which we hold one day sessions every month on the first Thursday of each month and we choose topics which are drawn from the very broad field of manufacturing especially those related to industry four and to digital manufacturing. We started back in January so this is um, we're well into the series now. Um, in August, we had a session on manufacturing with natural products. Uh, next month, we have a session on uh, meta material manufacturing. In November, we focus on uh, managing direct digital manufacturing. And in December, we have a session on in situ characterization of manufacturing. So something rather connected with the topic today. So welcome to all new participants and to returning participants and particularly to the speakers today. I'm particularly pleased to welcome colleagues in the RUN EU University, which is a European wide uh, program led by the Polytechnic of Lyria. Now we've reached September, I think we can look back on the, the first nine months as being reasonably successful. Um, and so we're starting to think about sessions for next year. And if you have any suggestions or want to be involved, then please let me know. Um, a new venture for the International Manufacturing Forum series that started this month is to uh, publish the conference proceedings um, with a opportunity to publish a full text paper if uh, speakers wish. And this will uh, be, these will be published in um, a book series that we have in the Center for Rapid and Sustainable Product Development called the CDRSP Knowledge Series. And each of these books will have a ISBN and so will be um, uh, indexed in Scopus. Uh, one feature that I'll mention now, but won't come at the end of today, is that we invite all participants to uh, vote for what they think they thought was the best presentation of the session. Um, and there will be a, a link to a, a poll put in the chat part of Zoom. And it's a very simple process to click and then select the presentation that you think was uh, the best one of today. Right, so before we start, before we start the scientific uh, program, some words of welcome from the President of the Polytechnic of Lyria. Hi all, it's a great pleasure as President of the Polytechnic of, of Lyria to um, be here in this welcome session um, on the Virtual International Manufacturing Forum Series 2021. Of course, I want to greet all of you but also I want to greet the chair of the conference, Professor um, Jeffrey, Jeffrey uh, Mitchell, as well all, all the integrated members of the uh, Center of uh, Rapid and Sustainable Product Development, the CDRSP, including, of course, the director, Professor um, Nuno Alves. This is a unique event. It's a, a, a huge opportunity to discuss the direct and digital manufacturing. In fact, during the whole um, the year of 2021, we will discuss every month one specific topic that we will share to all of you and with all of the world. In fact, we will start discussing in September digital twins. In fact, for us, for the Polytechnic of Leiria, but also for sure for the CDRSP, this is a unique and pioneer event 
because it's a true open science strategy uh, connected to open and um, um, free for all the participants. But I really hope that this outstanding series could be recorded and shared with all the world, not only um, through the higher education institutions and research units, but also with the companies that are connected with this topic, this outstanding topic of the uh, direct digital manufacturing. Please enjoy all the event during this year of 2021. Thank you for all of you, for all the shares of the conference to participate and to disseminate research with impact to society. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the chair of the September session of the International Manufacturing uh, Forum series, uh, Professor Paola, who has put a wonderful program together. So thank you, Paola, and over to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning to you all. Thank you all for participating in this event uh, related, as mentioned, to Digital Twins. Uh, my name is Paula Feria, and I'm a researcher here at uh, um, CDR, CDRSP. This event is, um, as mentioned, uh, organized by uh, CDRSP, the Center for, um, for Rapid and uh, uh, Sustainable Product Development, so uh, from the Polytechnic of Leiria. And so I'm also a professor at the Mathematics Department at the School of Management and Technology, also at the Polytechnic of Leiria working on modeling, simulation, and optimization applied to tissue engineering applications, focus on tissue regeneration, trying to mimic part of the bone process uh, regeneration. Uh, also, we work uh, um, in a different industrial uh, applications. So I'm working also in uh, projects related to industrial application. And, there, and uh, that's why we decided to uh, divide this day in two parts. Uh, the first part, uh, will be dedicated to the um, applications in life science and in the afternoon session we will have uh, uh, we will focus um, uh, our uh, presentations uh, will focus in uh, uh, industrial applications so as mentioned digital twin is one of the fastest fastest growing areas in the fourth industrial revolution so which will uh, complete the digitization of manufacturing industry uh, the this digital twin concept started with NASA in the 1960s, and the term digital twin was introduced at the start of this uh, century. So this is a, a very hot topic. Uh, um, a, a digital twin, as uh, because we have a lot of students participating, is a virtual model, or more accurately, a virtual environment designed to accurately reflect the physical objects. Sensors uh, provide a flow of information from the digital object to the digital twin, and the physical object can benefit from the information generated in the virtual environment. Uh, so this environment can be used to optimize the performance of the object and to help uh, reduce its carbon print. So this was uh, this is a, a very brand new topic. Um, the European Commission launched last year um, for the first time a, a call uh, related to digital twins applied to um, uh, life science. And uh, uh, we will have uh, this day, as I mentioned, divided in two parts, but we will start it uh, with the uh, overview of this concept uh, given, by, um, given by the Dirk Hartmann. Uh, thank you, Dirk, for participating uh, in this event. A senior principal scientist at Siemens in Germany, uh, one of the world leaders in the rapidly develop, uh, developing uh, field. And, um, and so we will start it, uh, the day with this keynote uh, uh, talk entitled Hybrid Digital Twins, a key uh, technology for the industrial internet of things. So I think we can um, start it uh, a little bit uh, early. Uh, I don't think that's a problem. What do you think, Jeffrey? Yeah, no, that's good. Let's go. 
Let's go, Dirk. Uh, all set. Good. Yes. So, so thank you very much for, for the very, very nice introduction, Paula. And let me quickly see whether I managed to share the screen. I hope you can all now see my screen. Does it work? Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay. Perfect. So, so thank you very much for, for this very, very nice uh, introduction. Um, already, I think, think in the introduction, um, or the various introductions, uh, welcomes we have heard quite, quite, quite a big, big topic to be spun from from manufacturing, Internet of Things, digital twin, mathematics. Um, quite, quite a challenge, but but I'll try my best. Um, I also do have a background in um, mechanobiology. Um, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. I've left the field 14 years ago. So, so today it's really about how mathematics, how digital twins uh, really shape the industry of the future, shape, shape manufacturing. And that is also basically uh, my key role at Siemens. I'm working at Siemens Technology, which is our corporate research department. Uh, and, and in the last 14 years, I, I've been pushing really the boundaries of, of what is possible. And, and uh, part of this I'd like to share today with you. But, um, so this is, is, is a manufacturing institute. So I thought let, let's start the presentation uh, with a manufacturing topic and speaking about manufacturing, um, that there is no way, um, I mean, definitely in Germany, but, but also internationally, you know, to, to not speak about industry for that. Um, so I guess the automation of traditional manufacturing and industrial practice you know, is all around us and, and clearly also very much heart of, of what we do at Siemens. Um, so the idea is to, to revolutionize this kind of you know, more manual processes, um, little automated processes to really go to smart machines that can automatically analyze, diagnose issues, not needing a human to intervene with manufacturing processes. Um, so that, that is, is the big vision. I think most of us really buying in, into this, this big vision. But then if we take a step back and look how, how things are done today, and here I took an example um, you know, from, from this mm -hmm. classical subtractive uh, manufacturing process, so a machining process. Um, and it's really, so I didn't find an English translation for this, but it's, it's the engineer const. So, so the uh, ingenuity of, of the engineer uh, to make these manufacturing processes run. And what we see here is, is just taking a machining program you know, designed or, or set up for, for a specific milling machine taken up to, an, to another machine um, and you get a machine crash. And the question is, is you know, what, why does it happen? Was the feed rate too fast? Uh, was a machine uh, was a piece rightly positioned in, in, in the working space? You know, did we have a good cutting speed? Did we select the right tool for this machine? And this is really the engineer when he needs to come in, set the right parameters also for the next machine. Yes, yeah, so, so still quite far away in industrial practice, very often from this sophisticated, highly automated way. Um, what we really would like, like to go is as sad to have this assistance needed so that we can automate the, these things. Obviously, IoT plays, plays a good role. I think from, from an IoT perspective, we already collect quite, quite enormous data today, um, but probably not, not make use of this. So, so there's a recent study a year or two years old from McKinsey who say actually only 30% of companies start or make use of this value we get from all these IoT data, et cetera. And to achieve this, this you know, autonomous assistance, uh, maybe first as an assistance for, for the humans, for the operators, and then in the next step as an assistance or, or running uh, robots autonomously to do that tasks, uh, we need new technologies. And, and uh, I'll try to make the case today that, that these new technologies, apart many other, other concepts, uh, tools, of course, at really mathematics, which, which makes a difference here and hope to share some examples along this. And obviously digital twins is, is really a, a part of this. So I'd like to start with a rough definition of, of digital twins. Um, and digital twins is, is really what, what is at the key DNA of, of what we do at Siemens. Um, so, so these days when, when you speak about Siemens, you know, many people still remember uh, the household appliances, uh, many people, you know, remember um, uh, the, the uh, gas turbines, etc. 
but this is all kind kind of the past yeah say households appliances have been spun out uh, Siemens Energy is, is now a separate company so Siemens at its heart uh, how it is today is really about connecting the digital and the physical world and digital twin is is a key technology to do so here is is a nice small video about uh, digital twins a small explainer we set up um, on, on YouTube, so, so um, you can find the link in the presentation. Uh, you can just take a picture, a screenshot, um, and, and follow the, uh, the code here. Um, but but uh, let, let me jump over this and, and rather give, give a small oral explanation here. Um, so in the end, it is as, as Paul Paula addressed, it, it's really about collecting the digital data which we have along the complete life cycle uh, all the way uh, from engineering data, sensor data, um, service reports, whatever kind of, of digital information we have, and then trying to predict how the asset will behave, how, how, how it will, will, you know, certain effects, uh, certain operations will change uh, the outcome of the operations. And what's important here is it's not really about collecting the information, but whenever we collect that information, we should have a clear goal how to generate with this, this uh, interaction some outcome uh, and ideally some, some business benefits. I'm trying not to give a too, too precise definition of, of digital twins here. You can go out to, to Wikipedia, you can go out to, to the different companies. Everybody is, is coming uh, with an own um, definition. I think it, it still takes the industry, academia, to converge towards, towards one definition. And that's probably one of the most important also tasks really to, to be completed in, in the next, next years. So I would rather like, like to focus on examples here and also take a little bit more uh, a point on, on the technology side, what, what is really important for, for the digital Obviously, if, if we speak about, about digital twins, uh, then it's very much about um, well, the real world part, getting the sensor data, that, that's really the IoT world. I think that that's quite, quite well addressed already. Um, so, so I'd like to focus here a little bit on the digital side, what, what is really required. Uh, on the one hand side, we need computational power uh, and everybody is, is aware of Moore's law. I mean, okay, there, there's lots of debate about uh, whether Moore's law will end, when it will end, uh, but then there will be more than Moore's law um, so I think we can, can really build on, on the exploding computational power. Yeah. Um, but then it's, it's not only the exploding computational power, but it's really also the breakthroughs in mathematics and computer science, which, which fuel this development. And uh, if you go to that, that source I, I, I cited here from CM, um, it's already five years old to that paper, um, but, but really shows that there's a similar exponential growth, which is even a, has, has a slightly steeper slope uh, for the advancement in mathematics and computer science than, than on the uh, hardware side. So if you bring both together, that's, that's really a, you know, double the exponential growth. So we really have, have a major computational capabilities now, uh, which can say, change things how, how we look at it. Um, then of course, being a mathematician, I always, always like, like to talk about mathematics and, and the algorithms behind, um, but, but I'd like to, to raise here, here two other points. A key limitation by, by just going and increasing the algorithms and the computational power is that, that uh, at the same time, we need to address the users uh, to make the use of these technologies much, much easier, much simpler, much more convenient. Because what we see is, is really that in many cases, the scaling of these use case and applications is kind of limited by the computational engineers we have today, because many of the tools you need sophisticated education, very long training in order to be able to use it, so that's why really novel com human computer interfaces, uh, which we see heavily entering the professional market, are really a key tool to foster also adoption and make this a success story. Um, so, so we have quite, quite some couple of augmented and virtual reality demos, which makes it much easier uh, for the users to understand what's going on and also to interact with the digital twin. And we can see, see some of them along this presentation. And then also semantic standards, knowledge graphs is, is a technology we see heavily maturing and, and uh, that is very important because collecting the various digital models, the various informations, bringing them together, this is really a key technology to make digital twins possible because otherwise it's just too much time needed to collect like, the different information. 
Um, speaking about, uh, because in the end, I'm, I'm a mathematician, but I think mathematics and computer science uh, background, you know, I very often get, get the question, uh, you know, wh why aren't you using AI, ML? What's the difference between using artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, between classical simulation approaches? Um, and actually, this is really what, what Digital Twins is, is about. It's really about combining those, those two uh, evolving trends or directions of how you can do predictions. Yes? If you have a broad knowledge, a broad simulation models, and that is typically what we get from the engineers. Yes, engineers these days try to encapsulate or to put their knowledge in, in simulation models. Um, then, then of course that, that should be used, but then in other axes as we generate more and more data by getting this data, we find our simulation models are probably inappropriate, not, not exact enough. Um, so, so we generate knowledge or, or data we could use for predictions just, just from these sensors. And so that's why the ultimate goal from my point of view is, is really to address hybrid digital twins, which combine the best things out of the physical models and the data-driven models. Yes, I mean, the physical models can cope with small data, while data-driven models really need big data, but at the same time, they need little domain knowledge. So the hope is really taking the best out of these two worlds um, so that we can do predictions with small data, little domain knowledge, still capture highly nonlinear complex relations, can rapidly adapt these things to new specific problems, and also have predictions which are consistent, physically meaningful. And this is really quite, quite a lot of, of things have been developed in, in the last two years on the machine learning community side, as well as on the simulation or modeling simulation optimization community. And I guess uh, we'll hear a lot more from Will in one of the, the um, keynotes and, and uh, Katarina later today. Um, so this is, is a, we have a great, great technology stack. Uh, and now we said, okay, the counterpart is the Internet of Things to, to get manufacturing forward. Uh, because the Internet of Things is, is really, you know, the system which, which collects data, etc., and which makes really, you know, bridges the, the real world to, to the digital world. And I would like to make here the case that really when we speak about that, then we require different technology, what, what would require what I call here the Internet of People. And why, why is this the case? So let's take a look first at, at the Internet uh, of, of the people. Um, so so we're basically AI and machine learning, you know, has, has been grown enormously over, over the past decade. Uh, the typical applications we find here uh, very often is chatbots, recommender systems, and, and the like. Yeah? So, so, I mean, uh, machine learning is there to recommend me a good book, to recommend me a good movie, etc., cetera, to, to find the right web pages for me. And obviously here, machine learning is, is the great and, and technology because we have high volume of similar data. Yes, people love to share data. Um, probably also taste is, is not too much different uh, in, in the different cultural backgrounds. And also people are not well understood. So, so there is no chance to, to use something else and then just working with the data. Now, if you go to the Internet of Things, uh, we, we have really, or manufacturing in this case, we have really very, very different decisions. Yes, it's about diagnosis. It's about control, it's about to decide when to have the next service, et cetera. And that's, you know, the impact is, is very, very much different. Uh, if I take a wrong decision here, then, then I, if I would just recommend you the wrong book or, or the wrong movie. Yeah, you would say, okay, well, this time maybe it's wrong. Uh, you know, next time I'll, I'll get, get, get another good, good movie. But if I do the wrong decision uh, in a manufacturing con context, you know, that, that might have severe, severe um, damage on the hardware, uh, but also, you know, might, might, might completely um, reduce your availability of, of the production line for, for a couple of weeks. And again, a big financial outcome. At the same time, it's very difficult to get data yeah, because it's, it's all very, very different context. Uh, for example, the data you can get from a machine tool depends very much on the material you're machining. It depends on the geom geometries you're machining. It probably depends on temperature, etc. Uh, also, companies don't like to share data. Yeah? So, so it's um, very, very difficult to, to bridge from one company to the next. Um, but, but there's one big advantage, and that is that machines are well understood. Yes? For most of these machines, we have great engineering models, um, rigorous mathematical models, so it's quite well understood. And that's why I think really it's about connecting um, the knowledge we have from, from the engineering models, the 
classical mathematics, physics based models and the machine learning uh, models is originating on on data. And uh, this kind kind of example here, I try try to make precise and also get to to that uh, a little bit more in, in, in the detail. Um, this is a use case where we tried to, to you know, teach a robot to do machining tasks. Um, obviously, trying to do that, that um, with a pure data approach might, might be challenging because online metrology, getting enough sensor data is difficult in this context. Yes, you cannot put a camera uh, with all the scrap fly flying around. Um, also, if, if you try to measure forces, um, that, that's really due to the very specific geometry. Um, the milling pass we, we, we are doing, um, what, where the workpiece is, is positioned, uh, etc. Um, so it's really also if, if we try to, to get data, it's high lot manual efforts to, to calibrate things if we would have sensors. In the end, would like to have real time predictions um, here compensating for deflections by the robot uh, needed to be calculated every four milliseconds. So that, that's hardly something you can realize at the setting. And if you bring in um, really these hybrid concepts of combining uh, the engineering models with machine learning capabilities, you get a completely different picture and really have a chance to, to change um, how, how you do that. Uh, and that's really why, why digital twins and particularly hybrid digital twins connecting the two worlds are really from my perspective, key for the next generation of decision-making tools. So, so what, for, for this assistance, uh, we are looking for in, in these manufacturing contexts. Um, so this has been now for, for, for the first half of the talk, you know, very high level, give you the big picture. Um, so I now would like to switch gears and really spend uh, the next uh, 20 minutes here, um, giving you a deep dive on, on three very, very specific examples, showing you and, and giving a feeling what, what can be achieved uh, specifically in a manufacturing context. And this is all prototypes, demos we, we have been set up and which are slowly making now and all their way. I mean, it's still, still all, all research part here, you know, only prototypes, pilots, but slowly making their way uh, in, into the um, you know, real products and, and offerings. I'd like to start with, with a robot milling use case. Um, and, and we started that, that project roughly five years ago. And, and uh, you know, when, when I taught, when we told people we'd like to teach robots how to do metal milling tasks, they told us, well, that, that's impossible. Uh, why is it impossible? Because the, you have quite high forces, couple of hundreds Newton meters if you do metal milling. And uh, actually, if, if you push a robot with a couple of hundred Newtons, it's moving yeah? because it's, it's a very unstiff structure. So, I mean, if you push it uh, due to, to the high um, ability to, to move and flexibility, you just push it away a couple of millimeters, one to two millimeters was, was these kind of forces. And that means you're one to two millimeter of um, the, the, the original geometry you wanted to mill. And that, that's not, not uh, you know, the industrial accuracy you can, can achieve. So what we've shown here really is how we could use, um, how we could use digital twins uh, to predict the deflection in a cycle of four milliseconds and then compensate for, for the deflection, to really allow the robot to achieve an accuracy uh, in this case of um, 100 to 200 uh, micrometers. Yeah, so and that, that's 0 0.1, 0 0.2 millimeters. And that's at least sufficient for, for a certain amount of tasks um, in industrial milling. So, so for typical roughening processes. And one of the First idea was um, in front of many machine tools, there is robots to do the handling. Um, so loading and unloading uh, the machine tool and the robot is waiting while, while the machine tool is, is doing the milling uh, job. So, so one idea would be have the robot uh, in parallel uh, to, to do the roughening task while the machine tool is doing the uh, milling task. Uh, so, so what did we do here? Um, the key idea is uh, we take the initial working piece um, in the manufacturing preparations uh, where we calculate uh, the, or, or where the um, G code, so, so the program, how the robot will be milled, uh, milling is, is set up. Uh, we not only calculate the milling pass, uh, but we also calculate uh, the forces we expect to occur. And we know the material properties, we know how much material will be removed. And from this, we can uh, calculate the expected forces. And then the expected forces are annotated to the original G code. Yeah, so, so we not only hand over the G code to the machine, but also the expected forces. And you see, uh, well, 
uh, somewhere in the movie, whenever you see a red box popping up, now that is actually the forces uh, we are also annotating in the G code. So, so we simply uh, add here additional degrees of freedom there, you see it. And that's really the forces uh, we, we hand over along with the G code. Uh, so the machine knows, knows the forces um, from, from the milling. Uh, at the same time, we have a robot model implemented on the controller. And uh, that model really does a model predictive control uh, to compensate uh, the robot actions for uh, the expected forces. So it calculates the anticipated deflections and then corrects those anticipated co uh, deflections. And by doing that, we can really uh, correct accuracies uh, by a factor of 10 and, and through that really enable uh, 10 times higher part qualities. Uh, also enable lot one machining because if you would do that today, you would, you know, you would machine one part, uh, look what, what needs to be changed, machine the next, etc. cetera. Uh, but then that, that's of course not lot one machining. Uh, and of course this allows us to go into the field of robot machining uh, on the one hand side, as, as I stressed, um, while robots um, for handling robots so would be one option. The other option would be to really replace the super big machine tools uh, we have uh, in particular in the aerospace industry where it's really about um, manufacturing par parts, which, which are a couple of, of uh, meters. Uh, the key three ingredients here is uh, we developed a new way uh, how to present uh, repre uh, geometries uh, to calculate then the expected force. Uh, that, that's super big models um, because obviously we have or need to bridge spatial resolutions from a couple of meters of the parts all the way down uh, to, to sub millimeter scale to really have this accuracy in the force prediction. Uh, so GPU parallelization was, was a very, very key issue here. And then last but least also integration into the control uh, because once you have the forces, uh, reaction of the robot depends very much of where you put the part, uh, et cetera. So that's why it was super important to have these predictions done, done on the robot. Um, and, and all this, uh, bring this together, the digital twin, the IoT, collecting the data, oh, by, by the way, uh, collecting the data. Um, we, we also calibrate um, during, during the machining process, our models. And um, Ori said, okay, we don't have any sensors here. Uh, that, that's not kind of true. We can very well measure torques um, just from the current of the spindle. And then we use the torque, which we also calculate upfront and the torque we measure to correct and, and compensate here for, for change material properties or if the operator has overwritten uh, spindle speeds or whatever. So here we have the opportunity to, to still do some online calibration with a few sensor sensors we have available. Um, that's still very much here. Um, classical um, model-based approach, not integrating machine learning, um, but, but this is, is really what we're now working on to look how can we bring machine learning into the picture. Uh, for example, for first part here is bring in uh, multi-fidelity modeling. So integrating or merging uh, the information we get from data and the information we get from models, as well as derive uh, heuristic equations for the forces uh, so, so that whenever we come, come to a new process, uh, what, whatever, uh, we don't need to do that manually and by that allows scalability. So that, that's the first uh, use case I'd like to, to present. Um, probably more the classical manufacturing subcapture. The next example I'd like to show here is um, 3D printing. Uh, when we speak about 3D printing, uh, very many research efforts focus on, on, on the printing process itself. Um, this is actually a very, very nice example about cleaning 3D prints. Yes? If you do uh, selective laser melting, um, we have this powder bed or, or powder bed fusion, I think it is called, where we, you know, we have a powder bed, then the laser on top, a new layer of the powder bed, the, the laser on top to uh, produce these parts. Then, then of course, the resulting part is filled completely with powder. And how do we get that powder out? Yes, and today that is in most cases a manual process. So, so really somebody shaking, uh, maybe, maybe with support of the machine getting the powder out. Um, but since the designs are getting more and more complex, that, that's a very, very difficult task to do. And so how can we support this? Yes, I mean, if, if um, manually that, that's not possible because you cannot look into these, these things. Yes, if it would be glass, of course, you would be able to look into uh, and then like these little labyrinth games, try to get the balls or the powder of it. So, so you might, might be able to do it manually, but, but you cannot look into it. 
Um, again, this is where our digital twin can help. Um, and uh, in this video, you can see on the top left, the digital twin. Um, so that's the geometry with the powder. The powder is not, not the exact resolution. Yes, it's a rather large, uh, a large powder representation. And we simulate the movements of a machine here, which is turning the stuff around. Um, and, and see where is powder left in, in the geometry. Out of this, uh, calculate a heuristic optimization process, uh, how to turn um, the, the geometry next. And then uh, in this iterative process, see after this turn how that impacts the distribution of powder inside. And through this really um, clean the 3D print. Uh, that, that's also a project a couple of years old, got, got an award uh, from, from the TCT organization, how to empty uh, these 3D prints and it's currently being actually in, in the process of being productized um, together with, with a partner here, uh, Solucon, who, who is building this, this machines. Um, and again, Digital Twins is, is a key insight because running the Digital Twin in parallel allows you uh, to kind of look into the, the part itself and, and figure out where the powder and then decide on the next steps how to remove the powder. Uh, key ingredients uh, is, is an efficient simulation of, of the powder itself. Um, so here we use a standard discrete element method uh, to simulate representative powder volumes. Um, a heuristic optimization approach uh, based in this case on the fast marching method. And then um, combining the two, uh, again, generation of automatic control code, which we then can feed to the controller and then who, who generates the program, how to turn the part uh, particularly. Um, two or three, three key things uh, allows first industrialization of additive manufacturing processes because you don't need the human anymore in the loop. Um, you can reduce loss of powder because you can be sure that, that you know, you get more powder out, out of your geometries. And last but least, I think that that's a very interesting case here. It's, it's not only the business aspect, having less powder, better qualities, but also less health issues. Uh, because this, this powder is, is very, very thin. And uh, so I'm not an expert here, but it seems like um, this powder is, is also having or potential effects on, on the health as one tries to keep humans as uh, far away for, as possible from, from the powder. Of course, having this industrialized automated helps also there on the health side. So that's uh, two, or have, have me now two examples um, on the process side um, of, of manufacturing. Uh, the last example I'd like to share here is uh, taking a look at the machine itself and how can I do um, support, for example, predictive maintenance, in increase availability um, of, of the production process. Um, now, the two production processes I've, I've shown up front um, were more and more discrete manufacturing processes. So, so the use case here is really more from, from the oil and gas industry. So from the process industry, um, uh, the use case, but it generally could, could, could be applied to, to any other uh, manufacturing process since this deals about electrical machines. And the key idea is how can we use the digital twin to, to really boost, oh, sorry, should, should have been availability. Um, the key issue is, is uh, with large drives. Uh, and you should now imagine also here in, in, in the video, a large drive. A large drive means a drive on the size of a room. And um, the issue here is that the uh, temperatures in this large drive during the startup process um, could, could become quite soon uh, relatively high. And relatively high means a couple of hundred degrees of Celsius uh, if you start the machine too often. And if, if you do so um, and, and would get these high temperatures, that would lead to severe damages on, on the electrical drive. Um, and so that's why today we have very conservative uh, schemes how to operate uh, these machines. So in order not to, uh, to run into thermal damage of, of the electrical drive. Now, the easiest question would be, why don't you add a sensor? Well, the point is it's about temperatures at the rotor. 
And you cannot put easily a temperature sensor on, on the router. So don't ask me why uh, this, this cannot be done, uh, since I simply take this always for granted uh, that, that it cannot be done. But I assume you have this very, very fast turning router um, getting there. A sensor are very reliable on it. Um, not affecting reliability of, of these machines is, is very, very difficult. Um, and reliability is, is really everything uh, in the oil and gas industry. So that's typically used for running compressors. And, and if, if you know, then the motor needs to be stopped, has an unforeseen outage, that, that's quite easily a couple of hundred thousand euros per hour in terms of cost uh, for, for the company operating this. Um, so when the colleagues came, came to us with this, uh, this problem, uh, again, um, key idea was, can't we have a digital twin running in parallel to the operations, which is predicting the temperature? And uh, this is what, what this demo shows. Um, running here in parallel, a full 3D prediction of the temperature in the motor. And it allows you really to estimate the temperature at any point in, in the motor. Of course, in our case, we're only interested in, in rotor temperatures, um, but, but can be used because of the 3D thermal distribution uh, to get the temperature at any point. And in particular, again, speaking about IoT sensors, so, so we could not put a sensor on the router, but we could put sensors on the stator. So, so these can we can use to calibrate, uh, to enrich and to improve uh, the prediction accuracy. Um, now, as I said, uh, we were interested in maximum temperature on the router. So the 3D visualization probably is, is not too important. Yes, because it's, it's, we're interested in exactly one temperature value, but actually it turned out that, that uh, the 3D visualization was very, very important to again, get stakeholders involved, convincing them that, that this is really a useful technology to put into the machines, because only having this, um, in this case, it's a Microsoft HoloLens and, and an augmented uh, projection of the temperature uh, to convince people that this is, is really working. Uh, but of course, in the next step, uh, this can be then also used to identifying really where, where the temperature from, troubleshooting, if you do that, mechanical things. So it's next steps we're working on um, for if, if you have a misalignment in the motor, identifying those misalignments um, mm -hmm. and then, then putting counter whites uh, on it. So this virtuality is a super, super intuitive way how to interact and understand what is actually happening on the 3D side. And in this case, you don't need some, you know, no, need no experience with complex 3D tools, uh, getting a feeling how to rotate things, but you just get the information in your natural environment. Um, and that, that's really for me a, a key learning also over the past 13 years. That, that really this user interaction transferring this, this information is, is at least as important as, as just having the right algorithms. Um, so how did we do that? Um, again, usability is, is a key issue today. You could maybe do that building small terminal networks, um, having this real-time capabilities, but that's too much effort to, to, to skip, have that as this in a scalable way. So what we did here is using model order reduction technologies uh, in this case, it, it was balanced uh, truncation, krylov mellers methods, uh, so, so relative uh, well-established methods to start from a thermal engineering model we have. And for, for any of these machines, we have these models. Uh, they are well calibrated. And then out of this, with using model order reduction, generate a real-time model. Um, the original models have 100,000 degrees of freedom. Uh, the real-time model has something between 10 and 20 degrees of freedom, which can predict uh, the temperatures. Then this continuous calibration, the loop, as yes, would like to be very, very sure that we are predicting the right temperatures because if it would predict a wrong temperature, would ruin the drive. Again, in the end, that will be quite, quite high cost. So we'd like to avoid that. Um, also uncertainty quantification plays, plays a role here to get an estimate how sure are we with a prediction so that we only switch on the machine if, if we are have a certain accuracy um, and uh, that, that we're sure uh, that, that we're below that, that temperature. And then last but not least, I already stressed that, that quite a lot, the immersive user experience uh, is important for, for this use case. Um, and then the benefit is that really we have this online capable simulation methods without additional effort. Yes, it's, it's just a few clicks for the simulation engineer who anyhow sets up the 3D uh, simulation model to get the reduced order model, which then can be packaged and run in parallel uh, on, on the real hardware. 
um, higher availability. Uh, so as an estimate is 20% reduction of, of stop times doesn't sound a lot. But then if you have in mind uh, that, that an hour is, is super, super expensive in the oil and gas industry, you know, result already pays off if, if you just get half an hour additional availability um, on, 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 the, on your plant. Um, this one was, was very, very much, and if you go uh, at the, 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 uh, through the links here, very much um, connected to, to the oil and gas and process industry, but of course, all of our machines have, have electrical drives. If we look uh, where, where failures coming from, they are very often coming from electrical drives, probably in many cases from the bearings. Uh, so that's why we are currently uh, developing these technologies also for, for estimating health study of bearings, et cetera. And having this digital model really allows us uh, to, to take a completely different approach. Again, what, what I've shown so far uh, and, and all the use cases and pilots we have, have out, uh, based on classical technologies. Uh, so, so the next step, or that's uh, more part of our research at, at, at the moment, is using a combination of physics and machine learning. Um, and, and there we, we try to endeavor two, two different approaches. Uh, the first approach is taking machine learning models and then annotating, enriching these machine learning models with physics knowledge. Um, so using physics equation as regularizers when training neural networks. And that's uh, coined physics informed neural networks. So that's more or less all the work going back to George Kanyadakis from Brown. Uh, so that's one uh, direction we are looking at. And the other direction we are looking at is that we say, okay, if, if we have a dynamical system, we, we, we um, assume we work in, in a context of dynamical systems, can we then identify um, model model components by means of neural network? And uh, the reference here is where we started what we called Runge Kutta networks. So, so we were really built uh, networks integrated or having the structure of a Runge Kutta neural network. And with this third example, I also would like to close my presentation. And I hope I, I gave, gave a good, good balance between or a good, good ideas on, on the super high level, um, the strategy, what are digital twins, what it is going towards. And I'm breaking that down uh, on real practical examples we're working on uh, out, out there in the field, as well as giving a few, few points out in, in the research direction. Now, I'd like to close here with a small advertisement. Um, I think there is a great conference being organized uh, in two or three weeks on mechanistic machine learning and digital twin. What's well, really about for the first time bringing together these two different communities of machine learning um, and more the modeling simulation. Uh, optimization folks are coming from from the engineering folks. Um, so thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you uh, so much Dirk, for your uh, such inspiring uh, presentation. Um, and once again, uh, thank you for accepting our uh, invitation. And thank you also, uh, Will Schilder, for helping us uh, um, uh, in through the uh, in, in this contact because so uh, will um, was uh, an important uh, uh, key uh, in order to try to to find you and communicate with you um, uh, so thank you also will for for uh, for helping us uh, because uh, uh, this talk was uh, very very interesting and uh, there's a lot of work it's been doing uh, by Dirk and uh, his colleagues and uh, in and Siemens, and um, uh, so now we are we have space for uh, uh, questions. Uh, anyone want us to to ask uh, one question uh, to Dirk? Yes, uh, Jeffrey. I have a question. So thank you. Thank, thank you very much for your uh, very uh, interesting and stimulating lecture. I wonder if I can ask you a question about the example you gave of the motors and um, the heating problem. I, the question I have is, I wondered whether the humans learned anything from this, this problem about the, about the physics and engineering of a motor heating in other words did did you discover 
I, I hesitate to say some new physics because not really physics, um, but some new some new aspects. Whereas if if you'd have approached it from a a standard sort of problem of uh, heat flow in a machine and doing a simulation of it, would you have ended up with the same uh, understanding, or did using this approach enable the 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 humans involved in the problem to see the error of their way in thinking about this problem in the past? Um, no, so, so the humans didn't didn't learn anything new new out of out of this, and this is kind of what I would say a, a key feature um, that, that that they didn't learn something out, out of this, and and the main reason is that we said. Whatever we, we would like to do here, we would like to build on the existing engineering knowledge. Yeah? Because the existing engineering knowledge that has been well validated in lab experiments and that is well trusted. Um, so that's, that's why we said, okay, what, whatever we do here, the ground truth we will believe on is the engineering knowledge. And that was important because everybody trusted that. And everybody said, yes, yes, this is our core knowledge and, and whatever, if you can show, you know, you got exactly the same predictions, then, then we start to believe you. Um, and that's why we also said, we, we really start from, from the engineering models we have and, and try whatever we do, you know, these real time models, et cetera, downstreams based on these engineering models and always show that there is a tight connection between the online models and the engineering models. And so that, that's why by design, we, we couldn't identify something new. And, and I think that was, in this case, very important to have the trust because all, all, all of these things you kind of, of, I mean, at least the key learning for me was, was without the trust, um, it, it's very, very difficult to get in the real world applications that's because if you look at a large drive, as I said, size of the room, that's quite costly. Um, you know, and nobody would allow you, hey, I have a crazy new idea uh, can, can I test it on the machine that that would be impossible? Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe another comment in, in this direction. I mean, for, for the time, we, we, we didn't learn something new, uh, but when we learn about calibration um, or identification of misalignment uh, in, in machines, then, then of course the operators can, can much learn much faster to identify where the misalignment uh, takes place, but, but that's not really learning about the physics, but, but rather learning much faster where, where the problem is. My, my question was related with this aspect, the validation and the calibration. What techniques are you using uh, uh, that you can talk us about? <laughs> because this, this is a step that is uh, very important. Yeah. Uh, on the calibration side, um, the good thing is here, um, that we have a model of the complete motor, yeah? so, so we can predict temperatures on the stator as well as the rotor side. And we have exact all, all the other parameters, yes, currents, uh, speed, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so, so we could predict the temperatures only from currents, speed of the motor, so, so the input we, we get from the control system, and then could use the sensor, because there are still in every motor a couple of sensors on the stator side, could use those sensors for calibration process uh, purposes. Uh, so in this case, we had a Kalman filter, and then uh, through this um, estimated, uh, then, then the, uh, and calibrated um, the simulation model. Uh, and then, then we had some, some additional uncertainty quantification on top, um, yeah, to, to have some, some rough estimation how, how accurate, accurate uh, we, we, we are. Okay, thank you. But, but really on, on both sides, the, the most is, as you know, Kalman filter, the, the least, most, most straightforward, most, most easy way uh, to, to add these things on, on top. Um, because key, key aspect is, I mean, this should, should run probably not directly on the control, uh, but but on on an edge computer next to the control, so that we also don't have uh, quite quite big compute power. Okay, very interesting. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Adir. Is there any other question? 
Uh, actually, as uh, Joana mentioned, the, the validation is a, a key issue. And uh, how, how, how can you share with us your experience uh, regarding the, um, because your, uh, this, uh, this uh, topic, these digital twins uh, are being uh, spread all over the, the world and the industries uh, are uh, all uh, wanted to jump into this new world and so is is it easy to to make them understand the the, the different company companies that you work with uh, that this is going to change their life they can trust the, uh, these the, uh, the the on the results that uh, the models are, are given uh, can you share with us your this experience um, yes yes um so I think for, first of all, on, on the validation side, um, I mean, not speaking about digital twins or anything, I think there, there's still quite a lot of, of you know, work to be done to convince even people that, that you know, the use of engineering model or use of simulation, uh, whether it's finite element computational fluid dynamics uh, in, in the use of engineering. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that, that's still still a way to go and it, it, it's, it's a difficult task. It's a task not only involving, or probably to, to the least extent involving technology, yeah? uh, but rather involving standardization, best practices, et cetera. And I think that there's lots of great, great work to be done. And um, knowing that, that this is, is a long way to go, that, that's why we always said, okay, whatever we do, let's try to, to you know, any stuff we do, we would like to tightly connect that to the engineering models. And, and uh, Anything, I mean, many often, I mean, all these applications are, are, are not new. Yeah? Um, model predictive control, virtual sensors, soft sensors, that, that's, that's not, not, not too much of a, of a new topic, have been around quite, quite long for the industry. Uh, but it always required you building a model from scratch. And, and on the one hand side, that, that involves additional manual effort, as well as then the question, how valid is, is your model? Um, in particular, many of the products you've seen that that's, you know, it, it's not high volume products. So, so you cannot really do, do lots of testing um, and then you would have no, no business or scalable business cases. Uh, so, so that's why, why for, for us, it's, it was important to say, whatever we do, we connect it to engineering models. Uh, on the one hand side, you know, somebody already took the effort to build that engineering models. They're already using it. So, so they are believing the, the engineering model to some extent, uh, trusting it. Um, and having this, we could then derive things automatically using model order reduction, real-time models or, or other technologies. Um, so there the manual effort is limited. We don't need to build models from scratch. It can be done by the simulation engineer uh, and, and it's trusted. And then, uh, so that's one part of the story. Uh, the other story is, is of course, building demonstrators. Yes, so with, without this demonstrator, um, okay, I mean, we obviously couldn't build, build a demonstrator with a large drive. Um, so, so that's why we've took, taken these, these two small motors, but, but actually the control running or controlling these motors was exactly the same control as, as for the large motors. And then by having these demonstrator pilots where you can show it, it really, really works. Um, that, that's another second big, uh, uh, second big ingredient here. Uh, to convince people. Uh, and it's, 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 as I said, not to be underestimated how important this human digital twin interaction is, making that, that understandable, graspable. Um, because you know, many of the people you will need to, to speak to, operation people, um, service people, they have no clue how simulation works. And that, that's why there's this tangible um, demonstrators with, with visualization uh, capabilities is extremely important. So from a mathematics point of view, I would say, okay, that, that's only a gimmick. I only need one, one temperature. Okay, thank you. Um, once again, let's give a big applause to Dirk. Uh, thank you once again for, uh, for, for joining, uh, joining us. Um, so we are now moving on to, um, to the uh, digital twin for uh, to the first session of this uh, uh, event, uh, digital twins for life science. 
uh, as we were able to see, uh, uh, there's a lot of gain uh, while using uh, the applying digital twins uh, in different life science pro uh, uh, problems. We will have the chance to um, know uh, a few um, related to uh, in biomedical applications, also in Alzheimer, in Alzheimer disease and epilepsy, uh, by Sofia Fernandes and Ricardo Salvador. Um, uh, we are not sure if we will uh, have the chance to hear today the talk, uh, the last talk of this morning given by ABS uh, dat data from the Soterix Medical uh, New York because uh, he has uh, uh, personal problems and he, he might not join. He's trying to, let's see if we have the, the, the chance to hear him or not. But we will uh, move on uh, into our next speaker, Sofia Fernandes from Lisbon University. Um, thank you, Sofia, for accepting our invitation. She, she's talking about realistic human modeling for biomedical applications. So, uh, Sofia, uh, are you ready to start? Yes, good morning to everyone. And thank you, Paula, for this kind invitation. Uh, I'm going to do a presentation um, on behalf of all our uh, group uh, research group, and actually our uh, principal investigator is here with us, is Pedro Miranda also, and uh, um, I will start by sharing my screen with you. Um, so do you see my presentation? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So um, I will start. Uh, actually, I will talk about more uh, in this in this talk on our work on a realistic human modeling, mainly regarding brain and spinal cord modeling. So in living tissues, uh, for specific uh, biomedical applications, is a bit different from our uh, great. Uh, invited talk that we have early on, and I really want to thank you, the previous speaker. Uh, so, uh, in this case, um, what we do, we try to, to, to model as the best we can and more realistic as possible um, the human tissues to, 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 to try, try to predict how using electric and magnetic stimulation. Uh, uh, how this will change uh, responses, biological responses. In the case of our group, we focus more on uh, applications regarding the central nervous tissues and the peripheral nervous tissue. So we call these techniques, the uh, neuronal stimulation techniques. Um, these techniques uh, employ electric fields to stimulate neurons and by two methods, electrical stimulation and magnetic stimulation. Of course, these two uh, will be uh, more mixed when we go on to use higher frequencies in magnetic stimulation, but still we separate a little bit these two kinds. And the first one uh, uh, is mainly through a current applied with two or more electrodes that can be applied over the head or over the, the, the first of all column. Um, and in the case of magnetic stimulation, a coil is used to generate a time running magnetic field that will in turn induce an electric field on the biological tissues that it's, are near the coil. This is one type of, it's an eight figure coil, but of course we, we, we can have different types of shapes, only a circular coil or even H coils um, uh, regarding the type of target and electric field we wish to, to, to generate using this technique. And what happens is that uh, these two techniques generate electric fields that in turn stimulate cells and originate responses that start at a, a microscopic level, but then they will affect the way neurons respond uh, because they will modulate and change the, the, the potential, the electric potential of the membrane and neurons communicate with each other to change it in this uh, uh, membrane potential. So it will affect communication between neurons and us. It will affect the way they transmit information throughout a, a nervous pathway. 
applications can be done and nowadays are being done for uh, the diagnostics of uh, neuronal changes in many diseases, uh, central and peripheral nervous diseases, such as, for instance, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or epilepsy, or the, that Ricard, Ricardo will talk about more specifically, and also uh, for treatment to, to modulate responses due to dysfunction. In most of the cases, these techniques are still under study, but for instance, uh, there are some electrical applications toward the treatment of depression that are already approved, at least in the United States. Now, these are very new techniques. Uh, of course, they are being studied for many years, but the, the, um, the, clinical, um, the clinical context is more and more open to use these techniques. Um, for just a brief overview, the main ones that we study and model in our research group are TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which generates a time varying magnetic field, which induces a strong electric field when we give only a single pulse, a, a, a strong pulse. And this can trigger responses throughout neurons, which we call action potentials. It can all, I will talk further on a little bit about this TMS. And also we can use electrical stimulation in the brain or in the spinal cord. Um, this electrical stimulation in the brain is called transcranial current stimulation. We can use uh, currents, weak currents, much weaker with a much weaker electric field induced than in the case of TMS. So this will not trigger signals directly, but it will change the way that neurons, neurons can respond, facilitating or inhibiting their responses. This is also important from the clinical point of view. And uh, we can do it either using continuous current, direct current, or alternating current. Our group focus more on modeling and studying direct current, transcranial direct current stimulation. And we can also use alternate or direct current to stimulate the vertebral column. But uh, the, the main focus has been on transcutaneous spinal direct current stimulation, which also uses very weak currents. When I, I speak about weak currents, I'm speaking about one, two, three, four milliampers applied through the, in the scalp, on the scalp, or on the vertebral column. These techniques uh, are seen as very advantaged because they do not involve surgical procedures. Of course, they are te invasive techniques such as um, deep brain stimulation and epidural spinal stimulation with uh, um, very good perspectives in terms of treatment, but sometimes patients do not respond well to these techniques and reject the implants. So this could be um, alternative approaches to combine with other therapies and optimize results in neurological treatments. Uh, and also in the case of electrical stimulators, these are more affordable and also can be portable, which uh, potentiates on-based treatment and uh, uh, clinical trials. I believe that Ricardo will also talk about this later on. Um, so regarding each one of them, so as I said, uh, in case of TMS, we have a strong prime magnetic field that induces an electric field according to the Faraday laws of, Faraday's law of induction. And there are two main applications already in use in TMS in the clinics, stimulation to, to provide, to provide a diagnosis of dysfunctions uh, and to study the mechanisms of action of substance. And this kind of technique is, uh, is, is being used for at least 10, 20 years in the clinical setting for diagnosis of, to, to measure, for instance, the speed, the velocity of conduction of electric signals, signals throughout the motor pathway, for example. And also uh, repetitive TMS, which uh, consists in giving um, uh, weaker pulses uh, of TMS for with a, with a specific frequency that can be uh, under one hertz to uh, above five hertz, depending on the purpose. And this all is already being uh, used, as I said before, on the treatment of depression. Uh, transcranial current stimulation. 
uh, induces a potential difference between two electrodes placed in the skull. And its main clinical applications has been to modulate, to modulate responses to treat problems such as chronic pain, fibromyalgia, also in stroke recovery in Parkinson's disease with some very uh, nice, very nice perspectives for the treatment of these pro motor problems and modulation of motor learning processes. For example, there's a study that I like to mention from AMO that, uh, use, uh, that uses the jepson jason taylor test on uh, uh, stroke, uh, chronic stroke patients. And that shows that when using TMS, the performance, the total time of performance decreases after simulation when compared to chain, to CHEM. This effect is only transient. After seven days, they did not see change, the change. So, but even so, it's very promising for, for instance, combining TDCS uh, with the rehabilitation programs, motor programs to, to accelerate the recovery of stroke patients, for example. And also, there are some applications of the prefrontal cortex, stimulation of the prefrontal cortex to treat depression, and also some additions such as food, alcohol, and smoking craving. There's some nice evidences on this. Regarding spinal stimulation, they are still under study and not applied in the clinical setting, but they also have some evidence of neuromodulation of spinal pathways applying in direct currents, modulation of some of the sensory evoked potentials related, for instance, with pain pathways in the spinal cord to relieve lumbar pain, for example, and also in the modulation of excitability in locomotion circuits in um, uh, incomplete spinal cord injuries. Uh, also, there have been some tri trials with magnetic stimulation which with nice evidence on re reduction of spasticity, which is a kind of um, motor freezing of muscles uh, that difficult the, the motor recovery of patients with spinal cord lesions, and also in the recovery of bladder function uh, in chronic spinal cord injuries also. Uh, so in all these cases, why should we model this kind of technique, non-invasive brain and spinal stimulation techniques? Well, um, the electric field induced by this kind of techniques is influenced by the structure of neural tissue. For example, germification patterns of the cortex. And also, there has been seen that the electrical conductivity of tissue, since uh, bone, for instance, conducts very differently from muscle and from the nerves, uh, will affect the way that the, the electric field will interfere with each one of these tissues. And also, the location and geometry of the electrodes changes how the electric field interacts and thus changes how the potential will vary throughout for instance, a pyramidal a cortical neuron as one represented here. Or in the case of the spinal cord, where we place our electrodes, will change the main, um, the, the, where the, the electric field will be higher and as its higher magnitude. So we can do models, realistic human models, to try to optimize electric field delivery at uh, each neuronal target, instead of multiplying several uh, clinical trials to try to find out which is the best placement. So we can first try to predict where are the best uh, uh, locations of our electrodes, of our coils, which will be the electric field direction, how this uh, direction relates with the orientation of neurons in our specific target, and then deliver it to our clinical part partner uh, what could be the best strategy and thus uh, decrease the number of clinical trials needed to find out the best changes, chances for each case or for each patient. In case, where, when we do modeling, this kind of techniques, uh, we have a general workflow. I will talk a little bit on that. Uh, we start have to have data image data acquisition that usually is made through using MRI images, magnetic resonant image, but actually we can use also another type of images such as CT. 
And usually you have to do two types, T1 and T2 weighted, because this gives, this enhances different tissues. And this will be important when doing segmentation of these images, which means try to separate each, each tissue and represent it as accurately as possible and turn it into the tissue masks. And then uh, this will help in the other, the, the final processes, post-processing processes of surface meshing and assembly of forces to do a full volume conductor model in which each tissue is connected to the next through an interface that allow us to calculate the electric field induced. And this will be of course the next step. For this next step, we have, we can, we have to define the tissue's electrical properties in some cases, we use conductivity tensors obtained from diffusion tensor imaging and diffusion weighted imaging techniques that gives a kind of information on the direction or the paths of tissues that conduct well, such as muscles and uh, nervous tissue. This is not always available and images are sometimes very, um, take a long time to, to acquire. But whenever possible, we try to use this information to assign tissues electrical properties. And then we have to model and place the electrodes and coils on the volume conductor model obtained, and then define our non-invasive brain and spinal stimulation parameters and boundary conditions to perform our calculations where use, usually used with the finite element analysis. We create a model with very small finite elements. Uh, mostly in our cases, we use tetraedal elements uh, because these give our smoother surfaces. And then we perform calculations using complex numerical modeling to obtain electric field predictions. Uh, concerning the first part, realistic, uh, building a realistic human model of the brain spinal cord, in the case of the brain, we have uh, some uh, open source software or not that are pipelines, very robust pipeline that gave a semi a, a almost automatic segmentation of the tissues, such as the Synip software and FreeSurfer, uh, for instance, which are open source softwares. And they also do perform the calculations. In the case of the spinal cord, this is a very recent field. The first modeling works come from 2014 from uh, an Italian team led by uh, Marta Parasini. Um, and in this case, uh, it's more difficult because there are no um, uh, pipelines that segment all the tissues. So we use masks such as from the virtual population family models that were already segmented and process a bit. These masks to create the volume conductor model do some artificial designs of the tissues that are not available based on Atlas human data sets as the visible human data set and use this information to create a volume conducted tetraedal mesh. There are also some voxel-like meshes, but in our case, we prefer these ones because we, we wish to design more complex tissues with very curved surfaces such that the gerifications patterns of the brain, the spinal cord, and vertebral pro um, processes. Uh, and so these kind of meshes do a more accurate description of the interface, interfaces between the tissues. Of course, they are more time consuming and processing consuming because they require surface meshing and non-manifold assembly procedures, uh, which take um, um, months months to get a full tetrido model. I hope that in the near future, this will turn faster in the case of the spinal cord. In the case of this, the, 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 the brain disease takes only some minutes to hours to get, depending on the model, the quality of the model that we want. After that, the, the, the second stage is to do the electric field calculation. And in this case, First, we have to know the dielectric properties of the tissues, namely the permittivity and the conductivity. And in some tissues that are more electrically conductive, they have anisotropic properties. We can get this from DTI imaging in the case of the brain. In the case of the spinal cord, 
This is a, a bit more difficult nowadays because it takes too, uh, a lot of time to have this information. And it's very, it, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's hard to get to, 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 to ask for a patient to, to be in half an hour inside an MRI machine to do this, so, or more. So we do um, considerations of tissue orientation on how it conducts differently longitudinally and transversal to the tissue and can define some theoretical tensors, for instance, for the spinal white matter in the surrounding muscle. Then we have to do the design to, to ascertain properties and place coils or electrodes in the models. And this work has been done, for instance, by Ricardo Salvador and also by, um, by me inside the team to design electrodes in case of spinal cord. In my case, in case of Ricardo, he focused on TDCS and TMS. Uh, and then we go on and estimate after we have the full model assembly with the electrodes or the estimation of the effects of the coils over the tissues, we then perform electric field estimate using the finite element method. In our case, you, you, we consider the stationary case, stationary studies because direct currents uh, can be, and the effects of TMS can be approximated to this. Uh, kind of equations using the Laplace equation, the relation between the electric field and the potential, and of course, Ohm's law, and considering the boundary conditions that Pedro Miranda is establishing it uh, uh, a long time ago, and that still guides us and will still guide us further on. Um, and so uh, I'm going to talk a, a bit on what we have done so far. Actually, Paula Feria also worked with us in the, the, the and some of this work also as a, a contribution. Ricardo Salvador, that was now in Neuroelectrics, um, Sofia Silva and others. So I, I'm, I'm going to show some of the contributions of the many people that your work with us throughout the years. And first focus was on modeling magnetic stimulation on the brain. In this case, uh, the electric field was estimating using this, the methodology that I explained before, applied over the motor cortex because it was the first studies done and uh, our team knew where was the main target. And after that, uh, our team focused on modeling what happened inside the cortex by modeling neurons and approximating them to electrical circuits and modulating the response of the electrical behavior. And this field is still, it's, uh, uh, there's a lot of interest now and there are many models, neuronal models that are being developed and studied. And the main challenge here is how we move on from macroscopic human models to neuronal cellular models. This is a main challenge and this work was a very, uh, a very pioneer work on this. Also, we tried to, 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 to get, uh, with the help of Ricardo, we took this work and tried to model a bit spinal stimulation uh, uh, magnetic stimulation. And what is interesting to see is that not only where we place the coil, but also how we orientate it, change how the electric field propagates and orientates itself on the spinal cord, changing the way that its magnitude distributes itself, not only in value, but in the dorsal, and frontal regions or lateral regions of the spinal cord, as you can see here. We also model transcranial current stimulation. Um, Ricardo modeled a lot of uh, different positions of electrodes, Paul also did it, and see how this changes, this shifts when we change, shift the electrode position. And this is important because you can model, uh, according to electrode position, we can model different regions of the brain. And so we can modulate different neuronal functions because the brain is parcelated uh, in regions that have different functions for pre-motor region, uh, more re related with uh, motor um, instructions and programming to direct motor uh, um, uh, 
uh, inducement to uh, prefrontal cortex modulation related with emotional responses. So we, what we see is that changing electrodes position changes the way the electric field behaves, thus changing modulation. So we have to find, we can auto optimize clinical pro, um, protocols for specific targets. Also, more recently, we have done some art, uh, some members, some students that joined us, such as Laura Santos, uh, did um, a systematic analysis of the effects of different isotropic conductivity profiles. That is, when when changing a bit our definition of conductivities, all these changes. The, the electric field magnitude. And this is important because there's some variability, uh, some large variability between uh, conductivities of tissues there. And this is difficult to obtain uh, measures of in vivo conductivities. So, uh, um, so this work is very important because it estimates what will be our error when predicting the electric fields in specific targets. And for instance, considering the, the left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which is a typical target for depression, for example, we can observe the uh, difference uh, that can go up to 80% in uh, estimates. And this is important to know when we change, when we use different configurations, such as a typical standard one with two electrodes, a bipolar one, or a multi-electrode configuration. And also, what are the tissues that most affect the electric field distribution, which are the conductivities of the cerebrospinal fluid, which is largely conductive in skull, and followed by the gray matter in the skull. So um, this also tells us in the biomedical field that it's important to advance our techniques to determine the electrical conductivities and work better on, on in vivo technique ones, because this will, will help us to have more accurate predictions of the electric field and thus will aid in better optimizing uh, our estimate, uh, estimates to guide clinical application of these techniques. Also, another very interesting work done for one collaborator from Spain that was with us for uh, one year and a half, which was Amparo Calhoun Ledlik. Uh, we work directly with Pedro Miranda, and they they also model the impact of using full models or cutted models, because for a long time uh, most of pipelines used uh, uh, cutted models because they did not have the full segmentation of the head. And what was the what will be the impact of using the, this type of models? And uh, they found a, a small relative difference. But when going to front or occipital montage with when using electrodes over the cutted regions near the cuts of these models, there was a difference when comparing larger difference about 50% when comparing to full ad models. And this tells us also that when modeling, we have to take into account to how, how accurate is our model, how extent it is if it translates very well the tissues near the electrodes, the, the electrode positions that we are thinking near the target that we are aiming. So this should also be considered when we are uh, using, uh, we're trying to use model guided TDCS protocols in the clinics. Uh, we have to see what type of uh, model was used, if it was cut it or not, uh, and if, uh, what kind of montage we want to use related to that. In TDCS, we also did some uh, modeling that guided the protocol, a study that we all also perform. Uh, I am sharing only one example here, but there's a lot more work done. And in our case, we, we, in this case, we did some four montages. These first three were already tried out in different experimental protocols, and we reused a fourth one by looking at the electric field um, uh, distribution. We see that it varies in extent, in magnitude, in spatial distribution according to the electrode's position, and also that every monster have a profile along the spinal segments represented here that is very diverse 
but all above this value, 0 0.15 volt per meter, which was which is the one value that is seen to be re related with motor triggering in TDCS. So uh, it's not a real threshold for activation, uh, but uh, for for modulation, I mean. But it's a, a reference that we use, and also that the motor that we rehearse give the highest value. So we think about why not use it to a protocol. And this is what I mean well, when I, I say model guided protocols, do an estimate, try three or four montages or more that we think it could be useful for a specific target and then pick the, 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 the best one and use it in the clinical setting. So we did in 10 healthy subjects, we registered sensory and motor evoked potentials to have an idea of motor and sensory responses. Uh, and uh, in this protocol, we applied stimulation for 15 minutes and then see the difference between using a placebo or sham stimulation and two different polarities, anodal and cathodal over the cervical region. And what we see is that on one hand, in the sensory evoked potentials were decreased a bit using anodal um, uh, or the latency of responses was slower the, the response was slower, the latency of the, the signal transmission was higher in the anodal condition. And also we saw that the latency of the motor response, in this case in the upper limb, because we are stimulating the cervical region, which is related with upper limb responses, it was faster, the latency was decreased. So the response was faster with cathodal condition and was also so associated with a decrease in central motor conduction time, which is a measure of how long the signal takes to come from the motor cortex to our hand. And this was faster than, and when comparing to a peripheral measure of this time, which is only from the spinal cord to our hand, also shows that this kind of stimulation that we use at this montage accelerated the central transmission only and not the peripheral one only from the spinal to the arm, but actually from this, the brain to the spinal cord. So it accelerated the transmission of signal in the central pathway. And this is very important in degenerative central degenerative diseases, diseases such as motor neuron um, dysfunctions, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and um, progressive bulbar disease and others and other diseases like this, and even in stroke, in the case of stroke, where the primary motor neuron transmission is very affected. So as take home messages, um, this, this kind of therapies can be very helpful uh, to, to treat cognitive, psychiatric, sensory movement neuro dysfunctions. And computational studies using models that reproduce accurately the human tissues can help and advise on adequate choices of electron voltages and stimulation parameters. And of course, these models can be as precise and possible and personalized to address each patient's specific needs. So what are our future lines of research? And we are already working on this. And I think that will be very interesting to listen to Ricardo and Abby, if possible, because I think they will give more specific examples on applications in um, for specific applications, clinical applications of these modeling techniques. In one end, to fine tune predictions, to have more personalized models, but also to see how will what are the relevant issues for in the current path, because uh, these models take very long to, to make, especially the spinal cord ones. And if we simplify the models on, with only the relevant tissues, um, may reduce uh, model complexity and uh, decrease computational time. And also look more at the cellular level, like our uh, previous members looked uh, to, to look at how uh, this type of techniques work at the biophysical, cellular, and network level. So try to model more neurons and networks to have um, 
a precise estimate and understanding how these techniques effective change, responses, how these the responses last, how long, to, to fine-tune our predictions and to guide the best as possible the clinical application of these techniques, which um, I personally think most of uh, uh, the people in the clinical set setting are uh, believing that this can be the future for the treatment, not only of neuronal problems, but many, many clinical bio, bio, biological diseases that affects us nowadays. These are our team members. There are some members that are not with us now that give that gave a very high contribution to this work uh, and still maintain a contact with us and help us uh, further as best as they can. And I thank them all. This is this joint work that I showed you from all these people, these great people. And, uh, um, and I thank the other ones that were with us throughout these years. I thank you for your attention and uh, uh, still pose as many questions as you like and even contact us. I have you my email um, with ideas, with uh, collaborations. Be free to contact us. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Fia, for your uh, such interesting uh, presentation. Um, I'm sure there's a, uh, we have, uh, <laughs> besides we are a little bit uh, uh, late as we are not uh, going to be able to hear uh, Abby ask data. Uh, so we, we extend a little bit uh, the time of Sophia's talk. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, uh, let's give a big applause to Sophia. And so we have now a uh, space for one or two questions. Anyone? Um, wants to comment yes jeffrey please thank you yeah sound on so thank, thank you. you great talk i'm sorry i had to miss a few minutes of it just to sort out something with my family but so if you answered my question then my apologies but when you're doing these simulations, uh, of course, you need some feedback, and the feedback comes from the patient. Ah, okay. In the case of the simulation, or in the case of the clinical protocol, uh, well, because I'm, we I'm, need thi to... I'm thinking okay. that you, you do the simulation to stimulate something, and so you need to have some feedback to know whether the stimulation was successful. Okay, okay. Yes. This is only done during the clinical protocol because yes. we cannot do a, a, a real-time simulation and a real-time stimulation in a patient because this yes. will just take a long time. This will be a future challenge. And of course, uh, our ultimate goal is to have the simulation ready and then stimulate the patient yes. and have already this, this feedback between information. But of course, we have to do what we do, you measure, we do some neurophysiological measurings on patient responses. And that was what I, I showed in the last slide. It's measuring the potentials, the, the evoked potentials that are neurological responses, potentials, electric potentials that come from uh, the nerves as they conduct the signals. And what we do, well, uh, we, we apply, well, we use the simulations to predict the best electrode montage, for instance, in the case of TDCS or TS spinal DCS. Uh, and then we apply the simulation for some time. Uh, and then we measured, we, we apply electrodes on the patients. We have to trigger motor responses in the patients and see all these responses differ when we apply stimulation and not and that is why we see if there is an effect there are so also and i, I showed uh, uh, in the in the beginning when i explained the um, transcranial current stimulation i showed a study uh, from omo that he also uses a task used a motor task that it was a series of small tasks like um, piling up checkerboards and placing uh, uh, placing objects 
like fine motor tasks of the end and it did stimulation and then see the difference be, uh, uh, when using stimulation and not. Uh, so we can also observe, it's not like a, a direct patient's feedback, but we, we test motor responses of the patients to see if they are there, there is improvement. In the case of depression, uh, there are um, uh, questionnaires that the patients fill out. And we, we, we then uh, compare uh, the, 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 the final scores of these questionnaires. So there's some feedback of the patients in one case, direct feedback of them. And other, in other cases, we have measures that we can use. I suppose my, the thought that was going through my mind was how you use the, uh, the, the feedback from the patients using the various methods you've described to um, update the protocol you use for the stimulation. Because if, I've, if I'm gathering the process correctly, the, 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 the patient response is in a sense a threshold. So it's like, did they receive the stimulation? Was the stimulation effective? But if it's, if it's a little bit below the threshold, then there's no response. And so, it's always a problem optimizing something if you don't have a quantitative measure of how far away you are from the target. If you yes, uh, I thank you very much for this comment because it's a real problem in uh, uh, neuronal stimulation because there is there are uh, responders and non-responders, and when we study, of course, you don't study only one patient. We have to have a uh, 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 a, a large sample or a significant yeah. sample uh, of patients because some of them do not respond. Some of them have uh, opposite responses, actually. Uh, the results that I show are average yeah. of 10. And um, I, I think that, uh, for instance, if we, we increase the pool, we have more significance in other changes. But this is why it's very important to go to the cellular level and also to have personalized modeling of each patient to understand why some of them are responders and some of them are not. And this is a real and big issue nowadays in this field of research. So uh, I really thank for this comment because there is no way, uh, um, there is, I think that Ricardo will speak a bit about that because there are some trials, there are some works that uh, um, can allow us at least in the case of brain stimulation, to try to have some feedback from the responses of the patients to, 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 to go on and have a more precise modeling and then prediction of, of what will work best. And I will not talk about this much because I, I think Ricardo will, Ricardo will refer this <laughs> on uh, their work. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Sophia. <clears throat> Lovely to see you. Thank you once Thank again you. for Thank your you. uh, participation and uh, Professor Pedro Miranda as well. Thank you. Once again, we give an applause to Sophia. Thank you, Sophia. And uh, so we move uh, uh, now to, uh, to our, uh, we have now a break, uh, like five minutes break, I would say. Uh, so Ricardo was supposed to start it at uh, 11.40. Uh, I think we should, uh, um, we should uh, keep the, the, the schedule. What do you think, Jeffrey? Well, a five minute break would be, would be good. So 11.50. 11.50, okay, Ricardo, okay. Yeah, that's fine with me, yeah. Thank you. So you see you in a, a couple of minutes. Thank yep. you.
Uh, so, okay, so we move on as we um, uh, decided. So we are now um, have the uh, lucky to have here with us uh, Ricardo Salvador, a very old friend. And uh, thank you, Ricardo, uh, uh, for being with us. Uh, he's working now in Aeroelectrics. In uh, so you're talking from Barcelona, right? Uh, yes, that's right. That's right. And so he's going to share with us uh, his um, his work related to hybrid brain models to optimize transcranial electrical stimulation effects on epilepsy and Alzheimer's disease. Thank you, Ricardo, for accepting our invitation and being here with us beside your busy uh, agenda. Thank you, Paula, for the, the invitation. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, let me just share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. OK, perfect. So um, thank you again for the, the kind invitation. It's, it's a pleasure to, uh, to talk about the work that we develop here in Neuroelectrics on uh, that's deeply related to this concept of, of digital twins. So um, my name is, is Ricardo, like Paula said, I, I work for Neuroelectrics, which is a company that manufactures um, transcranial electrical stimulation and EEG devices. Uh, but more than manufacturing the devices, we also are firm believers that modeling, uh, numerical models are really important to really take the most out of, the, of these techniques. And uh, the specific models that we are developing now in Neuroelectrics, we call them hybrid brain models. And the reason why we call them hybrid will become hopefully apparent by the end of the, of the presentation. And uh, at the end of the presentation, I will talk about two projects that we are involved currently where we are developing these hybrid brain models in the context of two, of two very important diseases. One is epilepsy and the other one is Alzheimer's disease. But before we get to the, the applications themselves, I think it's important to uh, understand a little bit uh, TES and the mechanisms of action in TES. And uh, Sophia already did a wonderful job presenting this. So I'll just go over uh, some of the of the points that I think are, are important to um, for the concept of hybrid brain models. So of course, TES and EEG are techniques that allow you to hack into the brain, hack in the sense that you can read information from the brain. So read electrical information by placing electrodes at the surface of the scalp. And of course, you can also write uh, information into the, the brain. This technique is called TES. The former is called uh, T, uh, EEG. Uh, and in TES, we can, of course, use the same electrodes that we use to record currents, but now inject currents with uh, these electrodes and therefore change the, the membrane potential of, of neurons. Uh, in order to, to do TES and EEG, you need a setup that's quite uh, common across manufacturers. So you need a stimulator, you need some electrodes placed in um, some positions in the scalp, usually by employing a, a head cap. And of course, you need a physical connection uh, between the stimulator and the, the cables. Regarding the stimulator, the one you see here is manufactured by Neuroelectrics. It's called Starsteam32. And these, uh, the, the current modern stimulators, they're current control devices in the sense that we can uh, adjust the voltage difference between the electrodes to maintain the current equal to the one that we uh, set up in the, in the protocol. They allow you to uh, stimulate via multiple channels. So you can, have via, uh, you can have multiple channels in the stimulation and some of these channels can also be assigned to, to EG. And they allow you to inject uh, a current of one to four milliamps, typically in different waveforms. And depending on the waveform, we give different names to the modalities of TES. Uh, the first one that was employed is called TDCS, where the current is maintained um, uh, constant in, in time. Uh, the electrodes that inject current into the brain, we call them anodes. And the electrodes that extract that current, we call them uh, cathodes. In TACS, yes, the current changes uh, sinusoidally in time with uh, typically a, a low frequency. And in TRNS, uh, the currents in the electrodes, they oscillate randomly in, in time. 
uh, depending on the protocol, the, the time of injection of, of these currents varies from 10 to 40 minutes. It's, uh, it really depends on who's applying uh, TES and the, and the protocol. Regarding the electrodes, they are usually placed in standard positions in the scalp. To do this, uh, we have uh, head caps that uh, have uh, some a subset of the 1010 EEG system uh, positions, which is a, uh, a system for um, uh, determining positions uh, automatically based on anatomical points. And regarding the electrodes themselves, the, the first generation of, of devices in the first applications, they use typically very large uh, saline soap sponges. When I say very large, I'm talking about the areas between 25 and 35 square centimeter. They were quite large electrodes. Um, and uh, we've evolved and currently we use smaller electrodes. Um, for instance, the ones you see in the picture are, we call them pi scheme electrodes because they have a radius of one centimeter, therefore an area of pi square centimeters. They are silver, silver chloride uh, sintered electrodes with a conductive gel underneath. And the importance of the conductive gel will be apparent uh, later on. These small electrodes are very important when we use multi-channel, uh, when you use stimulators that can output current to different channels, to more than two channels. Uh, because they allow you to take advantage of, of, that, um, uh, of that capability of the stimulator. And, and the importance of this, uh, hopefully I can motivate it further uh, down the road. Of course, that in order to configure the currents, we need a software that um, is usually installed in a computer that communicates wirelessly with, uh, with the device. So how does TES work? So, uh, Sophia already mentioned this, so let me just uh, go over this relatively quickly. Uh, to understand this, let's go back to what happens when we initiate the, the stimulation. So imagine that you have the, the stimulator that's connected to electrodes that are placed on the scalp of the, of the patient. Okay. So when you turn the device on, the first thing you need to understand is that the charge carriers in the wires are electrons. But the charge carriers in the in the head tissues, they're, they're ions. And therefore, at the interface between the electrode and the tissues, a chemical reaction needs to happen where these charge carriers um, are converted from one type to, to another. And this reaction requires a specific voltage difference to, to happen. And uh, in order for this voltage difference to, to be achievable by the typical batteries that we have in these devices, we need to have a mediator between the, the electrode and the, the tissue. And this mediator is that conductive gel that I mentioned uh, previously. So with this gel, if the impedance is, is low enough, uh, a current is, is set. And uh, physicists like to describe this, this current as an electric field. And of course, the way you can reconciliate these two views is that the electric field exerts a force in the ions in the tissues that establishes the current. The electric field, of course, is a, is a vector. So in each point of the tissue, it has a, a magnitude and it has a, a direction. And uh, this electric field is crucial for us to understand the effects that simulation has on neurons, as, as Sophia uh, also mentioned. So we know from uh, cable theory, which is a, a theory that um, studies the interaction of uh, the electric field with neurons under some, some assumptions, uh, we know that the component of the electric field that mostly changes the membrane potential of the neuron is the component of the electric field aligned with, the, with that neuron, okay? With that knowledge, we predict that the neurons in the, in the brain that will be uh, more easily targeted with TES are long pyramidal cells in the cortex. And why is that? Well, uh, it's because, first of all, they're, they're long, like I said, so they're they usually span several cortical layers. And on the other hand, they have uh, a very consistent organization and um, orientation throughout the, the cortex. So they are, or, uh, they are oriented in the way that they are perpendicular to the cortical surface at each point. So with this information, we know that the component of the electric field that's mostly responsible for changing the membrane potential of these long pyramidal cells is the normal component of the electric field. And this forms the view for, for that typical um, message that people have from reading papers about TDCS that 
under the anode where the electric field is going into the brain, you have typical excitation because if the electric field is pointing this way, you have an increase in the membrane potential of the soma. So therefore an increase in the excitability of these neurons. And under the cathode, the electric field is pointing in the opposite uh, direction. So you would have the opposite effect. So you'd have a decrease in the polarization of the soma, which leads to a decrease in uh, cortical excitability. This, of course, does not mean that other components of the electric field aren't important. They do change the potential of neurons in, in, other, uh, in other structures of the, of the neuron. However, this is a, a less robust effect because the orientation of these other structures that are susceptible to this component of the electric field are more, are more random. So now that we know that the electric field changes the membrane potential of neurons, we need to understand by how much. And there are works that show that this change is very, very small. So in TES, we know that the, the range of membrane potential change uh, per electric field uh, magnitude is about 0.3 millivolts per volt per meter of applied electric field. This is well below the threshold for a generation of action potential, because with the currents that we generate with uh, TES, we get electric fields of the order of one volt per meter uh, at most. So uh, we can expect polarizations of 0.3 millivolts. So the question now is, what can such small polarizations of the neurons actually achieve? And we have some clues into this. So we know that the neurons aren't completely at rest uh, in the brain. So they are undergoing uh, often action potentials discharges. And uh, even a very small uh, electric field can change the timing of generation of these action potentials. And they can speed up or slow down these action potentials, therefore leading to this increase or decrease in excitability as well. And this also forms the basis for um, entrainment of neuronal activity that can follow uh, the application of TACS. So in TACS, you may have um, a, a coherent uh, firing of the neurons with the frequency of the applied electric field, which you call neural uh, entrainment. But of course, these are effects that um, they are acute effects, so they only happen while the stimulation is, is occurring. So, but for therapeutic applications, for clinical applications of TES, we want these effects to be more permanent. And we think that these acute effects can lead to plastic changes in the brain via, via abian plasticity related mechanisms. And we have papers that show that if you have a DC electric field being applied in a neuron that's undergoing a protocol that's leading to uh, long-term potentiation, that depending on the orientation of the electric field, you can get a boost on the long-term potentiation or a decrease on the long-term uh, potentiation. And this forms the, the basis for what we, um, for the organization of most protocols that use uh, TES these days. So instead of applying uh, TES in one session, they apply TES over multiple sessions across, for instance, uh, two weeks. So one session per, per day of about uh, 20 to, to half an hour, 20 minutes to half an hour. And then they evaluate the results of stimulation over a period of uh, four to, to eight weeks uh, after. This, this, this type of protocols, they, they have been very successful in some uh, clinical applications. And I will mention some of these studies uh, later. However, they also show something that uh, Sophia already mentioned, which is a considerable intersubject variability. And of course, intersubject variability in, um, in biological systems isn't anything to be surprised at. I mean, we can look at what's happening with the responses to infections by, by, by the coronavirus. Um, however, uh, there are several mechanisms that can lead to this intersubject variability. And some of them are intrinsic to the, to the subject, like attentional states, uh, and they may be related to the specific synapse organization of the, of the subject's uh, networks. However, I would like to focus here on some parameters that we can control that have a decisive effect on uh, stimulation. And these parameters are the intensity of, of stimulation. So in the case of TES, the, the current that we um, uh, inject via the electrodes, 
the size and shape of the of the electrodes and the position uh, of the of the electrodes that we use. And why are these parameters so important? So these parameters, they control the electric field that will generate. They control not only the strength, but also the spatial distribution of the, of the electric field. These parameters are what we call dose parameters because they affect the, the electric field distribution. And we know from what I mentioned before that understanding the electric field distribution is crucial in understanding the effects of, of stimulation. Of course, that there are ways of measuring this electric field in vivo. This is done, for instance, in patients that have SEG uh, electrodes implanted for, for other reasons, uh, or using special MRI uh, sequences um, that uh, can detect the tiny magnetic fields generated by the, the small currents uh, induced in, in uh, TDCS. Uh, however, these methods don't allow you to get a very high resolution image of the, of the electric field, uh, which is important in order to understand its effects. So uh, we need to employ numerical head models. And this type of numerical head models is um, the same as Sophia uh, presented in, in, um, in her presentation. She did a wonderful job presenting that, so I'll be going very fast on the methods to generate such, such head models. In neuroelectrics, we call these head models biophysical head models because they allow you to predict the current propagation in the, in the head. So uh, again, Sophia already mentioned this. I'm just going to go over briefly on the methods that are used to generate such head models. You usually start with a structural uh, image, usually a, 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 an MRI of the head. You then segment that image into different uh, tissue types. You create a 3D geometric reconstruction of uh, the different uh, tissues. And at this stage, you can also add electrodes in the scalp, depending on the, the type of electrodes that you use in your, in your experiment. And then you have to solve the equation that gives you the, the electric field in the, in the head tissues. And that equation is called Laplace's equation. And it's very hard to solve that equation for such a complex geometry. So we need to rely on um, numerical methods uh, like the, the finite element method. And uh, in order to, to solve the, the equations, you need to have um, the currents of the electrodes and of course the electrical properties of the tissues, the, the electrical conductivity of the tissues. And then you can visualize the results. So what can we do with these, with these methods? So the first type of application that, that uh, people started to, um, to consider when they developed for the first time uh, pipelines to, to create such methods, such uh, head models, was to look at studies in a retrospective manner. So what does this mean? It means that we would look at the study where they use a specific montage with a specific type of electrode. We would try to reproduce this in some standard uh, head model. And we would look at the properties of the electric field distribution and try to put the results that they got into context um, that they got in that study in the context of the electric field distribution that we got from the, the, the numerical uh, head models. Um, one more recent and uh, more powerful approach is to, um, instead of using these models to look back at what happened in the experiment, use these models to optimize the position of the electrodes and plan that experiment. And how does this work? Well, what this does is that we define an area that we think is an area of interest where we want to have a specific uh, effect of stimulation. And then we run um, an algorithm, we call it a montage optimization algorithm, that what it does is that it optimizes the currents and the places where you put the electrodes in order to achieve uh, an electric field that has the desired effect on the target. And it is to do this that having uh, stimulators that can, on one hand, have more than, than two channels available for stimulation, and on the other hand, uh, using smaller uh, electrodes, that it becomes more important to, to have these, uh, these properties available because uh, they will allow you to get an electric field distribution that's more focal, that can um, adapt better to even complex targets that we may be interested in. So let's go over a little bit uh, how we can uh, use these, uh, this montage optimization. 
So like I said, we focus mostly on the normal component of the electric field as the proxy for the concurrent effects of stimulation for the reasons that I mentioned uh, before. The specification of the target can be done uh, either by painting the target in the MRI of the patient or by using, uh, for instance, Neuroelectric's uh, uh, target editor, which is a, a 3D editor that the patients can uh, use to, to paint the target in a, in a template head model. And then we need to run the optimization itself. So the, the algorithm that we use in Neuroelectrics is called Steamweaver. Um, and this algorithm needs three inputs, basically. You need the head model that was created for the patient. You need uh, a target electric field, so normal component of the electric field map, and you need a weights map. So the, the map with the electric field component, uh, the target electric field, uh, the target value of the normal component of the electric field will specify the effect that you want to have on the target. So if the electric field is pointing one way, you've got excitation. If it's pointing the other way, you've got inhibition. If it's zero, you've got no effect areas that you want to shield from the effects of stimulation as much as possible. And the weights is a map that identifies the importance of such areas in the optimization algorithm. So the optimization, what it does is that it minimizes uh, this function. We call it Ernie which is basically the least squares difference between the weighted normal component of the electric field induced by the montage and the weighted target normal component of the electric field. Uh, we also run a genetic algorithm that uh, searches the best electrode positions to limit the solution to a maximum number of electrodes, which depends on the, the stimulator that you have available. And we can, of course, constrain the solution to a maximum current per channel or to a maximum total injected current. There's two points I would like to make at this, uh, at this stage. The first one is that the head models that we build uh, can include lesions. So uh, we've been considering that the head models so far are of, are of healthy people, but most applications of, of TES are in fact in, in subjects that have some sort of structural lesion, be it a, a cortectomy in the case of epilepsy or uh, a craniotomy. Uh, some of these lesions, they can be in incorporated into the head model, and they are very important because they can dramatically change the electric field distribution. Another thing that I would like to stress here is that targets, they don't always have to be highly localized areas in the, in the cortex. And in fact, in many applications, it's interested to go to networks of areas in the cortex. For instance, in this study that we participated some years ago, we got some resting state fMRI uh, data uh, with areas in the cortex that were correlated and anti-correlated with um, activity on a seed point located on the left motor cortex. And the rationale that we used for optimization was let's target the areas that are correlated with that activity. Uh, let's mark, mark those areas for excitation and the areas that are uh, anti-correlated with that activity will mark it for inhibition. And we got the optimized montage. And when we use the optimized montage in subjects and we compare it to a typical bipolar montage with the anode over the, uh, the motor cortex, the left motor cortex, we saw that the excitability changes with the network approach were much higher than the ones with the traditional bipolar montage. And excitability here was evaluated by motor evoked potential amplitude following um, TMS. So uh, network simulation is indeed a very interesting uh, approach. But like I said at the beginning, now we're developing a new uh, type of models. We call it hybrid brain models. So why hybrid? And um, well, the, the thing is that the models I've described so far, we call it 1.0 models. They only have one type of information, information about how the currents propagate in the, in the head. However, it's very important to understand how the electric field changes uh, the state of the, the neurons and the networks of neurons we have in our, in our brain. And um, instead of the you know, typical assumption that the electric field pointing one way leads to one effect and pointing the other way leads to, to another effect. And to do this, we need uh, still structural data from the MRI. We also need functional data from SEG or EG, for instance, and we need connectomics information. So data on how the different regions in the brain are connected, which can be extracted from the MRI uh, data, for instance. 
uh, after we have this data, we create two types of models. So the biophysical head model using the methods I described before and the physiological brain model, which has uh, neural mass models that are personalized to reproduce relevant physiological data using the connectomics and the functional data that we got for the patient. When we combine these two models, we get this hybrid brain model. And this hybrid brain model allows us to um, derive uh, therapies based on montage optimization using algorithms that will be different than the ones that I described before. Um, and these treatment options will be more robust. At least that's what we hope. So um, I would like to, to just quickly go over the two projects that I mentioned before, where we are developing these, these hybrid brain models. Uh, the first one is related to epilepsy. Um, and before we, we start with the hybrid brain modeling approach, we started seeing if the, the original 1.0 model, so the model with the, the steam weaver optimization, if uh, it would work well for patients with focal epilepsy. So we, we ran this study a couple of years ago, it's just been, been published recently, where we stimulated 20 patients with focal epilepsy. Uh, this was done in cooperation with Boston's Children's uh, Hospital. And um, the protocol that we followed was very simple. So we asked the attending physician for each of the participants uh, to identify um, in the, the head model, uh, the region that was the focus of the epileptic uh, seizure. And then the optimization rationale was very simple. Let's mark for inhibition that area. And we got personalized montages for each patient. And when we did this, we saw that uh, seizure frequency evaluated in a post-stimulation follow-up period of eight weeks uh, was significantly reduced in many of the patients that we, uh, that we stimulated. Um, and this is, of course, uh, a big success, and it shows that even a simple idea can be powerful. However, you do see that we have some patients that either didn't respond or responded in a direction that was opposite to what we would expect. So there's still certainly a lot of room to, to improve. And it's within this context that we are developing these hybrid brain models. Um, the project where we are developing these hybrid brain models uh, for epilepsy is called Galvani. Uh, and in this project, we're creating neural mass models that can reproduce the um, different stages of an epileptic seizure. We need to personalize these neural mass models using the SEG data collected for the, the same patients. And to do this, we need to study the, biophysic, the biophysics of signal propagation in SEG and signal generation. And of course, we also need to improve on our methods to uh, study the interaction of the electric field with the neurons. So we need to have detailed models of, of neurons and understand how the electric field interacts with these, uh, with these models. And at the same time, we need to develop ways to bridge the two ranges. So very detailed models of the neurons, the microscale model to the mesoscale model, which are the, the neural mass models that I described uh, before. And uh, this is still ongoing. Hopefully uh, next year I'll have more news regarding this project. Uh, another application that I would like to talk about briefly is, is Alzheimer's. So the, the rationale for the usage of TES in Alzheimer's comes from this paper from Yacarino in 2016, where they showed by, by optogenetically stimulating uh, a specific subpopulation of intraneurons in uh, mice with, with Alzheimer's. Uh, at the frequency that's, um, uh, that's close to the gamma frequency at 40 hertz, uh, they saw that that would lead to a decrease in beta amyloid deposition in these, in these mice. So this, of course, led us to, to formulate an hypothesis um, that we explored in a, in a study that's been submitted uh, recently, where we got for each participant of the study, so these were all patients with Alzheimer's, we got maps of amyloid beta deposition. And uh, we divided these maps into two clusters and we marked one cluster for inhibition and another one for excitation. And then we stimulated this with TACS at 40 Hertz. And what we saw was an increase in perfusion 
on the, the temporal uh, lobe that correlated well with episodic memory recollection in these patients. So this, this seems very promising. And um, because of this, we are um, currently participating in another project called MirrorTwin, where we are developing hybrid brain models, but now um, in the context of Alzheimer's disease. So we will create neural mass models that um, can be uh, personalized to reproduce the relevant physiological uh, data for, for Alzheimer patients. We will personalize these models using uh, EEG and fMRI data, and we will develop um, personalization uh, strategies. So the project also started this year. So hopefully next year, I will have some more news about this. So I'd like to, to finish this. If you like um, to know more about uh, EEG and TES, please visit us at, at neuroelectrics.com. We have uh, a lot of... Um, resources available, freely available on the site where you can learn more about uh, these techniques. And you also, if you were interested in the type of modeling that we do, please contact us. We, we offer these modeling services to, to our clients. And with this, I would like to, to stop. So if you have any questions, I'll be free to answer them now. Thank you so much, Ricardo. Uh, such an inspiring uh, presentation with all those these uh, applications. Uh, we have uh, now uh, time for uh, first give a big applause to Ricardo. Uh, we have now time for one or two questions. Anyone? I think that shows I did a great job and everyone was was clear. Congratulations. <laughs> Maybe I can ask a question, Paula? Yes, of course. Well, uh, uh, Thank you, a non-serious non and a serious question. So the non-serious question is, uh, I mean, Ricardo, you were talking about mice with Alzheimer's. I mean, so how do you know that the, the mice have Alzheimer's? <laughs> So that's a great question, and I'm by no means an expert. We call these um, animal models. So we, we've become quite good recently in uh, finding ways of giving mice, especially several types of diseases. And we can do this by, and when I say we, not me personally, like the people that do this research, uh, they can do this by editing some, some genes, by using some sort of uh, toxic um, components that they feed to the mice that target specific, uh, for instance, channels in the, in, the, in the neurons or specific populations of neurons. And this can lead to very similar symptoms to what we observe in, in, these, in these diseases. It's not fun for the mice, but it's, it's very important for, for research. And that you, and then you notice in their behavior that they are, well, they seem to have something similar to Alzheimer's. Yeah, it's it's actually a great point because I mean, not all animal uh, models, as far as I know, can reproduce all the symptoms that you get in a human because you know, mm -hmm. my a mouse is different from from a human, and depending on the type of uh, model that you use to to induce such uh, such an effect, you end up. Uh, replicating some uh, symptoms of a, of a disease or other symptoms of a, of a disease. In this particular case, I think they were specifically looking for the, the amyloid beta uh, or beta amyloid deposition in the, in the mice. Oh, yeah. So that was the non-serious one. The, <laughs> the serious one is, I mean, you were talking about the positioning of the electrodes uh, being determined, I think, by uh, some kind of machine learning algorithm, or uh, can you explain a little bit more? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a genetic, it's an evolutionary genetic algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, so what we do is that we generate first a uh, basis of solutions. Uh, we call it a, a lead field matrix that we can use to generate any solution that, uh, or any the electric field in any montage using a combination of these electrodes. Um, and with this, we can... Um, uh, run an algorithm 
that explores different possibilities for the currents of the of the neurons and the position for the currents of the electrodes and the position of those electrodes to minimize the difference in the sense of the, the least squares difference between the distribution of the electric field that's induced by the montage that's being evaluated and by the the electric field uh, specified as the target by the by the user and what that does is that we we end up with uh, with a solution that usually has a lot of channels the evolutionary part of the algorithm comes after so we we use the genetic algorithm to limit that solution to a, a specific number of channels because i mean not always you need a solution with 23 or 24 channels to to mm -hmm. stimulate the small target so you want to limit that um, oh, yeah. to make the montage more practical yeah okay thank you thank you bill uh, so no more questions. Um, so I think, um, as well, let me say again that we are not. So Jeffrey, you want to mention something? Sorry. Oh, it, it was just a, a a question following up the the last one. So how does the the because now you're using electrodes which are very different sizes and uh, geometry to the human case is. Is it a simple scaling problem, or is it more complicated? So the regarding the optimization algorithm, we always consider that we are using the same electrodes. Uh, so the the pi scheme electrodes that we that I mentioned before. Uh, that's not to say that the same methods can't be applied to other types of, of electrodes. But if you have, for instance, bigger electrodes, you have less positions available uh, because they, they will start uh, contacting each other. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, Paula. No, no, you're welcome. Thank you once again, Ricardo, um, Thank you. for participating in this uh, International Manufacturing Forum series. Uh, thank you all the speakers and thank you all the participants. We we will we end now the um, the first session of this day, um, uh, digital twins for life science session, and so we are uh, back on, at two p.m. Uh, Lisbon time for the session two, digital twins in industry. We will start by um, our um, keynote speaker, Will Schilder from Eindhoven University of Technology. And so he's here with us. And uh, I take again the opportunity to say uh, thank you, Will, uh, for your um, such an important uh, collaboration in organizing this amazing uh, program and panel that uh, we have uh, here today with us. Thank you. So we, we are now back at 2 p.m. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Also in digital. Um, today, um, uh, in the early morning, we, we focus our uh, talks um, uh, and our discussion in the digital twins applications in, in life science. And now we are going to have um, a, a, a keynote invited and contributed talks uh, focus on digital twins uh, in industry, applications in industry. Uh, we will start this session uh, with Will um, uh, Shilders. Uh, I would like to thank you, Will, uh, for joining us. Yeah, uh, I know that you have a, a, a big, uh, be very busy uh, agenda, uh, and uh, you you took uh, um, uh, so, uh, uh, space for uh, for joining us in this event. And thank you for that. Thank you once again for helping uh, me and us in uh, organizing this wonderful program. And um, Will Schilder, Schilders is a professor at Eindhoven University. He, he was uh, one of the last uh, presidents of the European uh, Network for Mathematics uh, in, in, in Industry. Um, and um, 
uh, it is a pleasure uh, to have you uh, here today with us. Uh, and uh, I would like to uh, deeply acknowledge your um, kindly uh, collaboration uh, with us uh, throughout uh, these uh, uh, years. Uh, so, Will, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Paula, for these kind words. And uh, it's a pleasure to, to collaborate with you. I mean, I think it's an excellent initiative, this forum series, and uh, happy to uh, take part in this first edition. Yes, so I'll, uh, I'll share my screen for the talk. So this afternoon, we're going to look at digital twins for industry. Mm -hmm. And let me make a slideshow of this. I hope the screen is visible now. Yes, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes. So uh, thank you again. Um, yeah, so what I would like to do is look at the academic side of digital twins. And uh, Dirk, Hart <laughs> Dirk Hartmann already touched upon this this morning. Uh, he mentioned a few times the role of mathematics in uh, establishing digital twins. And that is what I want to make a little bit more explicit in this talk. Uh, I myself worked in industry for 30 years. We worked on simulation software. And of course, that is also already a little bit in the direction of digital twins. Um, but uh, nowadays, uh, things have evolved much more. And uh, so uh, the sim simulations have to be much more accurate. And that is what I will concentrate on. So the rationale be behind this talk, I mean, we all know that these digital twins are very important. And uh, Gardner, for example, they make uh, reports on top 10 strategic technology trends every year. And uh, digital twins have been named in the past few years uh, all the time. I mean, you see here uh, a page from the 2019 uh, uh, strategic technology trends, but uh, also in 2018 and 2020, you see the same uh, uh, topic mentioned. So it is a very important topic uh, for, especially for industry. And uh, industry is indeed investing a lot in digital twins. And you could see that from the Siemens talk this morning by Dirk Hartmann. But on the other hand, there's also many claims that are being made. And uh, sometimes I'm a bit skeptic when I see people talking about uh, digital twins because probably they are not sufficiently accurate. And in that case, maybe you cannot talk about digital twins. And uh, the way to overcome this is to uh, use uh, strict mathematical procedures so that you can really achieve having a digital twin. And for the mathematicians, this is really a very nice uh, thing because there are many challenges to be addressed. And I will mention a few in this talk. There's uh, other people saying the same thing. I mean, uh, Karen Wilcox is a very uh, esteemed colleague from uh, Texas uh, before she worked in MIT in Boston. And uh, well, quoting her, she says, it is such an exciting time to be a computational scientist. The field is in the midst of a tremendous convergence of technologies that generate unprecedented system data and enable automation, algorithms that let users process massive amounts of data and run predictive simulations that drive key decisions. And the computing power that makes these algorithms feasible at scale for complex systems and in real time or in situ set settings. I think she's absolutely right. And I will mention her later in this talk again. She's one of the important people in this uh, field. So the contents of my talk. Um, uh, first, I will talk a little bit about the value of mathematics. Uh, Dirk touched upon this, but uh, as I said, want to make a little bit more explicit. And then I will focus my attention on uh, MSO, Mathematical Modeling Simulation and Optimization. And even more specifically, MSO in a data rich environment. And that is what we are faced with uh, nowadays, especially for digital twins. And then I will uh, discuss some challenges, mathematical challenges that we have for digital twins. A challenge on coupled multi physics problems, also on how to incorporate uh, high performance computing methods, and also on artificial intelligence. And I will finish my talk with an example, short example, and also conclusions. So let's talk about the value of mathematics for a moment, <clears throat> because there are some things that people don't know. 
and uh, I always try to uh, well tell people about this so that uh, that you realize that uh, this is happening. So what about the role of mathematics? Well, I think mathematics is very important nowadays. The world is becoming more and more complex and mathematics is present and needed everywhere. And a colleague of mine, a Dutch colleague, several years ago said he compared mathematics actually to oxygen. You take no notice of it when it's there, but if it wasn't there, you'd realize you cannot do without it. And I think that's the same with mathematics. I mean, often you don't see it, but it is certainly there. This holds especially in the area of computational science and engineering. I mean, simulation is uh, often termed the third discipline. Third, because it is next to experiment and theory, which are the traditional disciplines. But simulation came up when computers started to occur. And uh, mathematics plays a crucial role in this uh, simulation and also in computational science and engineering. Um, if you go to industry, you will see that designing is done behind the screen. Everywhere there are virtual design environments. And mathematical methods are indispensable here. Uh, also in areas like digital twinning or high performance computing, artificial intelligence, etc. But often people don't realize how much of the mathematics needed to solve a problem is, is under the surface, so you don't see it. And when I was working in this industry, I faced the same problem. I mean, uh, the mathematicians made the uh, algorithms and produced the software and the engineers could make new designs using the software and the mathematical methods. And often the credit went to the engineers and the mathematics was not mentioned. So I always said that mathematics uh, is an invisible contribution to visible success. There is a uh, lot of things that you can say about mathematics. Sometimes there are things that uh, uh, other people, I mean, mathematics, mathematicians have special skills. Uh, they can abstract and they, uh, they, they look at things in a different way. And uh, this is an excellent example, I think, from Volker Meermann in Berlin. He was looking at uh, the phenomenon of disc brake squeal. This is very annoying and it's happening a lot in the automotive industry. And uh, the automotive industry had been trying for many decades to reduce the squeal by changing the design of the brake and the disc and uh, with uh, several tricks. But uh, they did succeed. And then in 2015, there was a project of Volker Meermann together with the automotive industry. And what they did was they uh, performed a detailed mathematical analysis. And when they did that, it revealed actually that there are bifurcations uh, because the designs that were made contained highly stiff springs that were used to avoid the rigid connections. But so these, these structures led to bifurcations. And once they found these bifurcations, um, they could solve the problem. Uh, but the negative effects of this design technique and the resulting uh, bifurcations were really a surprise to the engineers and to the industry partners. And uh, all car manufacturers since then were very interested in the results that uh, Meerman uh, presented. So this is an example where hidden properties of an underlying system could only be revealed by mathematicians. There is more, and uh, Dirk Hartmann touched upon this, but I would like to give a little bit more detail here. So everybody knows about Moore's law for electronic components and uh, uh, computers uh, speeding up every uh, two years. And that's uh, due to this Moore's law uh, that was, and it uh, holds already for 50 or 60 years. What many people do not know is that there is also Moore's law for mathematical methods. Here you see an example uh, concerning the solution of uh, large linear systems, which is part of many simulations. And what you see is that we have a similar Moore's law also for the algorithms, that's the red curve. And of course, these effects are strengthening each other. And you see that even more announced in the example of linear programming, uh, within 15 years, the algorithms improved by a factor of 3,300, whereas the machines improved by 1,600. Multiplying these effects, you get a factor of 5.3 million, 
which meant that simulations that took two months in 1988 took approximately one second in 2004. Yeah, and this, this means that what people sometimes think that uh, all the developments that we see nowadays, all the simulation power is only due to the machines. That's absolutely not true. And in fact, if we would only rely on the performance improvements in the machines, in the hardware, we would now be doing the simulations of the 1990s. In fact, we could forget about digital twinning, of course. We would have to wait another 20 years. But fortunately, we have also these developments on uh, algorithms. And another example is given by mixed integer programming, where the uh, factor is even more stunning uh, that was achieved by the algorithms. Yeah, so and, and, and this, as you can see, I mean, uh, simulations that could not be done in, in, a, in a lifetime would now be uh, reduced to one second because of this. So clearly, the mathematical methods contribute significantly to speed ups in computational science and engineering. Uh, they outperform the hardware speed ups. This also means that working on improved algorithms is really vital for digital twinning. So we should not do, just use the hardware that is available, but we should also work on the algorithms and improve them even more. Touching slightly on another value of mathematics is the economic value of mathematics, which is also important for industry, of course. I mean, uh, we did, uh, there was a report in 2012 uh, by Deloitte in the uh, UK. We did the same report in 2014. The French contacted us and made a similar report. Uh, it was published in 2017 and the same in Spain 2019. The Germans are still discussing and making such a report, but they have a very nice book that was made in 2008 in the year of mathematics, where they produced this book with captains of industry. It's entitled uh, Mathematics Engine of the Economy. There are very stunning figures in these reports. Um, for example, that the mathematical sciences are contributing for up to 26% of total employment in the country. And also that the economic contribution represents about 30% of the national income. And in the UK, they have done a recent uh, report where they looked at the rate of return on investment as a benefit to cost ratio. And it was estimated for several disciplines. And well, engineering, physics are more expensive in materials. So their uh, rate of return is, is, uh, is uh, lower. But you see that mathematics uh, has the highest factor by investing in mathematics is a good thing. It's, uh, it's very uh, smart to invest in mathematical sciences. Okay, that's uh, the value of mathematics that I just wanted to share with you uh, in a little bit more detail than what uh, Dirk did this morning um, and giving you the message that, I mean, so machine improvements, fine, but uh, algorithm improvement is, uh, is absolutely necessary also in the area of digital twinning. Good, then let's concentrate on the topic of uh, this afternoon. So uh, uh, digital twins for industry. And here the challenge is uh, to do the modeling, the simulation and optimization uh, in a data rich environment. Oh, what is modeling simulation and optimization? I mean, it's really the cornerstone for development of most products. Uh, I was talking about the virtual design environments. <clears throat> And uh, so uh, MSO is really part of the life in, in industry in designing products uh, and uh, studying processes. Of course, there are the new developments like high performance computing or uh, data science, artificial intelligence, but uh, their impact on innovation and on the improvement of products and services will remain partial without a massive effort on the axis of modeling simulation and optimization. So we really have to take care of this. Uh, major opportunities, for example, the development of digital twins really rely on connections at the interface of several disciplines and domains, and also across the complete life cycle of products and systems. And a high level approach on mathematical modeling simulation and optimization and enriched by the data analytics and intensive computing is really a considerable economic asset. So that is what we were after 
mathematics, uh, sorry, MSODE, MSO in a data rich environment. And we think this is a very important new development. And it's really a key enabling technology for Europe. I mean, I already showed some reports, uh, the impact studies in, in Europe that you see summarized over here. Uh, the mathematicians have also published several reports uh, on this. Uh, and some people have estimated the value of MSO in Europe. And you can see for several industries and you can see that, I mean, the numbers are really very high. So investing in MSO is a, a good thing to do. Now, the future development of industry and society, it exhibits strongly increasing complexity. Uh, that's what we saw before. And also at the same time, shorter design cycles. They become shorter all the time. The other hand, there is digitization and using the Internet of Things, and they have led to an explosion of data and information. But we think that without novel computational tools and paradigms, it will not be possible to manage all of these challenges. So there is a clear need to strengthen the competitive advantage of Europe in industrial innovations, starting this new initiative, MSODE. And uh, later on, I will talk about uh, the uh, influence of artificial intelligence, uh, because we have to also look at uh, incorporating that in our uh, methods. Now, Europe is uh, not in a bad position. I mean, uh, as you, if, if you look at the... Uh, uh, major simulation companies in the world, and the two largest ones are still in the US, but slowly but steadily, the European software companies, uh, simulation companies are uh, picking up. You see the SO system and also Siemens are growing, growing on their own, but also by acquiring uh, software companies, smaller software companies. So they will soon uh, probably uh, be at the same level of the of as the US firms. And that's great, of course, for Europe. Okay, so what is then the state of the art uh, <clears throat> uh, here? Uh, the digital twins, they are powerful masterminds driving innovation and performance. And it is predicted uh, that companies that invest in digital twin technology will see 30% improvement in cycle times of critical processes. So this is a rough estimate that we uh, found. And uh, there are successes claimed already, um, but the classical MSO approaches uh, will not suffice here. And also the techniques for data analysis and machine learning will not be enough to achieve this goal on their own. What we have to do is something else. Um, we have to invest in mathematical paradigms to combine all the things that we see here, high performance computing, artificial intelligence, traditional computational science and engineering, because the accuracy of models is really of the utmost importance. And uh, for that, mathematics really plays a big role. And uh, I'm a fan of ex extracting the mathematics from the traditional software and hardware terminology. So what we did was introduce the terminology mathware, <coughs> where we uh, uh, distinguish the mathematical model uh, development uh, from the software and the hardware. First, a lot of mathematics has to be done in uh, method development before you can write software. Uh, but of course, the researchers in mathematics must engage in discussions with the software people and the hardware colleagues. We did that in the past already with software people, but also in the hardware area, we can actually uh, achieve things by discussing with hardware people what would be good for our methods. We should not just accept the hardware that is present, but we could also talk to the hardware people and suggest changes. And one of the examples is uh, where you could actually, I mean, many computers are 64-bit nowadays. And, uh, well, uh, simulations uh, are very expensive then. What you could try to do is uh, make approximations using 30-bit or 32-bit or 16-bit representations. But the transformations between these three, 64, 32, and 16, are not so easy on the present hardware. And there is special hardware, for example, FPGA, where you could actually do this in a much better way. So, but this should be then discussed with the hardware people. 
Anyway, so I think that we should look at the picture like this on the left uh, more often and not just restrict ourselves to software and hardware. So what are the mathematical challenges for di digital twins? There are quite a few. And uh, one of the first and foremost ones is uh, to uh, look at coupled multi-physics problems. Yeah, because digital twins, they require very accurate models. And this probably means that you need to include more effects than you do nowadays with the software that you're using. We were simulating semiconductor devices in Philips and also electronic circuits. But you might be, uh, well, you might have to include thermal uh, aspects in it, maybe even also magnetic or uh, 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 mechanical. Uh, so, Several aspects need to be looked at at the same time. So Multi-physics is key, but if you just combine available software modules, then this will lead to very ex uh, expensive simulations. So what we need is dedicated methods for coupled problems uh, in order to reduce simulation times, because we want to have more accuracy, but we also want to reduce computation time so that we can actually do maybe real-time simulations. That is actually for a digital twin is really required. And uh, for example, this morning, uh, Sophia mentioned the Comsol Multiphysics software. Um, and uh, I don't know whether they couple all the modules uh, separately, but uh, so you should really have interaction between the modules and do special things. These uh, coupled aspects are very important. And uh, what leads to from a mathematical point is that you have off diagonal coupling blocks. So temperature and electronics, they, they have influence on each other. So that's what mathematicians call the off-diagonal coupling blocks. It might be weak couplings, might be strong couplings. Um, the problem is that if you put this all in a big matrix system, then the matrix properties might deteriorate. And this might not be very favorable for solving these systems with uh, traditional methods. Furthermore, what we would like to do is uh, use model order reduction. It was mentioned also by Dirk this morning, and uh, possibly also low rank approximations so that we can actually reduce the coupling blocks and concentrate only on the dominant features that, that uh, explain the behavior of the device or the process. So model order reduction, and Jack made this clear this morning, is extremely essential in the context of digital twinning to reduce computation times and to make uh, real time possible. Uh, we had a large European project, AU Mornet, and uh, as a, the final outcome of this project, we had uh, we published a handbook of uh, model order reduction. Uh, it consists of three volumes. Uh, the first two volumes are on theory, and the third volume is on applications. And the nice thing is, since it was done with a cost uh, project, uh, we were able to. Uh, to make this open access so everybody can just download all of these uh, volumes and uh, you don't have to buy them. So briefly for the experts then, um, what do we do in, uh, in uh, these uh, coupling blocks? I mean, uh, suppose we have a system where we uh, have two aspects being combined. This leads then to a two by two block matrix. What we do with the off-diagonal coupling blocks, which might be strong or weak couplings, we decompose them, as you can see uh, in the product, B3, C4 transpose, for example. Then what we do is we approximate the components by low rank approximations. And we do this by, well, it's a very subtle method, actually. It's a generalized singular value decomposition, uh, which means that the off-diagonal block is reduced in a low rank fashion by taking into account also the values of the diagonal block, A11 in this case, and A22. So doing that leads to this uh, system. And then after that, we can, uh, with a separate basis reduction method, we can actually use uh, model reduction on two individual systems. Yeah, so this, this is a very powerful method to, uh, to use in this coupled context. 
another uh, challenge that we see is uh, high performance computing. And uh, well, you probably know that uh, um, in many situations, um, when you do simulations, you have to solve large linear systems at the core of the simulations. That's the, really the, the key task to be performed. And uh, many methods have been, oh, sorry, the slide show has, yeah, okay. The fast and direct and iterative methods have been developed since the 1970s. One of the most popular methods is the uh, well-known ICCG method. And uh, it has been uh, used on a worldwide scale and in many software products. So this is really very satisfactory and makes uh, software modules very, very fast. The world is changing and uh, high performance computing has entered the picture a few years ago. And what we will need is uh, high performance computing for digital twinning. And this also means that our methods for solving linear systems are adapted to the high performance computing. This is also said, for example, uh, by, uh, by very influential people. I mean, I attended uh, the Euro HPC event in Sofia uh, two years ago, and uh, Thierry Breton, he was then the CEO of the Atos company, but now he is the French commissioner in Brussels. Um, he had uh, four main messages in his keynote talk. And as you can see, he is really talking about modeling simulation and optimization being uh, important and structuring new business opportunities. He was also talking about digital twins. So it's also recognized at the higher levels, as you can see. But for mathematicians, it means that numerical methods need to be revisited. Um, if you look at the numerical methods that have been developed since the 1950s or 1960s, uh, they often have inherently serial components. And in order to outperform the machine performance, like we did in the uh, before, as I showed before, uh, numerical methods need to be rethought and also reinvented. We have to eliminate the serial components and replace them by inherently parallel components. Another aspect is communication. So we should also make sure that the methods that we define are, or develop uh, are communication avoiding because communication is often more expensive than doing calculations. Now, ICCG, the famous method that was uh, very satisfactory up to say 2010, uh, in its present form really performs very badly on today's supercomputers. Every year there is a list of supercomputers being made, uh, the top 500, and uh, people test uh, solution for linear systems, for dense systems, but also sparse systems. And ICCG is then the method for sparse systems. And on the next slide, you see the performance. And, uh, please have a look at the right column, which says what fraction of the peak performance is being achieved by running this method. And you see that it's very bad. It's uh, between one and 2% on all the top 10 supercomputers. So this is a very bad show. Yeah, so it means that uh, there is a big challenge here for numerical mathematicians, for mathematicians to improve the uh, performance of solutions of linear systems on high performance computing machines. It should go up to 50, 60, 70% preferably. But uh, so far we have not succeeded. So there's really a big challenge here. The next uh, challenge is uh, the convergence of AI methods. I mean, artificial intelligence is really uh, uh, coming up uh, in recent years. And uh, what we are thinking of is to combine these AI methods with first principle approaches. First principle approaches have been used uh, so far. Uh, we make models of physical processes and systems, and then we uh, solve them, we simulate. Them. But now AI has come into the picture. Now, there is a whole list of things that uh, people want to do with digital twinning and uh, made the list here. We'll not discuss all of these items here. So you see that, for example, exploiting new computer architectures is, is one of them. Um, also allowing real-time simulation. Uh, but the important thing that I would like to discuss now is uh, 
versions of AI and physics-based models. Now, machine learning is very prominently uh, in the press uh, nowadays. I mean, it's really transforming our world in many ways. And uh, you see many articles with the name machine learning in it or with, uh, with uh, artificial intelligence or neural networks or whatever. There is also a lot of criticism coming up, uh, especially in recent years. Um, there are serious limitations to current methods as well as to the understanding of us, of the success of machine learning. We often don't know why certain uh, AI methods work, or we don't understand why they do not work. And uh, Robert Dijkgraaf, uh, uh, shown here, he was the president of our uh, Royal Academy of Sciences. He compared machine learning with 16th century alchemy based on an accumulation of tricks topped with a good shot of credulity rather than on the systematic analysis. And I think he's right. He also quotes somebody else, uh, Al Ali Rahimi from uh, Google, who last year accused the subject of artificial intelligence of mathematical thinking. And he's not the only one saying this. I mean, uh, in a recent article in the New York Times, um, it is said that uh, today's AI systems know surprisingly little about any of the concepts time, space, and causality, and that few people working in AI are trying to build such background assumptions into their machines. And the more recently, uh, a few weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal published this article, Why Artificial Intelligence Isn't Intelligent. Yeah, so you see that there is a growing uh, criticism on the way people are doing artificial intelligence uh, right now. And uh, there's a lot of room for improvement, uh, we think. So first of all, I think that uh, there is a lot of work ahead for mathematicians in the area of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and also understanding the working of neural networks. We may even need to build uh, entirely new networks, and I think we have to do that. Uh, well, I'm working on this in very recently, I mean, 2019, uh, George Kaniadakis started with his physics-informed neural networks, where he actually combines traditional differential equations with neural networks. And he calls that physics-informed neural networks. Because uh, there's a lot of information. I mean, we don't want to throw away all the knowledge that we have acquired in three, 400 years. The Maxwell laws, the Navier-Stokes laws, and whatever. Yeah, so, but for the parameters in these systems, it's often good to use neural network representations because we don't know exactly what the models are for these parameters. And Karen Wilcox, again, um, she stated that the future needs computational science and engineering being blended, uh, sorry, blending data driven and physics based perspectives. And again, I agree with her statement. So what we are trying to do is combining physics-based and data-based science and engineering. You see here the physics-based um, uh, science and engineering. There's also data-based science and engineering. And uh, well, what we should do is uh, look at hybrid science and engineering, combining these two. Specifically in the projects that we are running right now, we look at so-called mimetic methods. Uh, methods that preserve properties of the underlying system. We think that they lead to more accurate uh, representations and simulations. Uh, but the problem is how to develop my mimetic neural networks or mimetic machine learning methods. That's really an open challenge at the moment, and we are looking at that as well. And Dirk uh, Hartmann also showed this picture, or at least a similar picture this morning. Uh, and in one of our most recent projects, uh, this is what we, what we wrote. And uh, you see here the, the physical models, their advantages. Yeah, so based on small data, et cetera. And also data-driven models. What are the strong points of the data-driven models and what are the weak points? And by combining these, we could actually get a much stronger methodology. And uh, well, this is what the deck showed this morning. You can extend your knowledge uh, about the physics, but you can also use more data 
And uh, well, the, the trick is of course to combine these two uh, and use both the physics and the data-driven models. So the conclusion really is that uh, there's a lot of work ahead for mathematicians in the area of artificial intelligence, machine learning, also understanding the working of neural networks. You may even need to build the entirely new networks. And for digital twinning, I think we need these physics-informed neural networks, for example, the ones that were presented, that are presented by George Kaniadakis. And what I always tend to say is that uh, also in view of the criticism on, on AI, we need real intelligence, and you can read mathematics here, but also other uh, disciplines, real intelligence to make artificial intelligence uh, work. And I think that's uh, very true. Okay, I finish with an example. Uh, you can see for this example also the SIAM newsletter that was uh, published actually last night. Um, uh, here is a nice uh, example of a mathematical foundation for digital twins. And uh, it's an article by uh, Karen Wilcox and uh, some other researchers on probabilistic graphical model. These, uh, these models, they provide really a powerful mathematical abstraction for modeling complex systems. And uh, they also serve as foundation for generalizable and scalable computational methods. And uh, these are, for example, used in, in the area of robotics. And that's where the ideas come from, of course. In the context of digital twins, such a probabilistic graphical model, it enables data-driven asset monitoring. It also uh, enables uh, digital twin model updating and model-based prediction, but also planning, decision-making, etc., all to be formulated as probabilistic inference tasks. And one can exploit the graphical model structure to develop principled and scalable algorithms, carrying out uh, several of these inference uh, tasks. And, uh, for an example, uh, so uh, on the next slide, uh, you will see the real example. But to develop such a model for digital twins, we first need to formulate a mathematical abstraction of the system. And uh, well, in this case, they use six key elements that are defined in the picture on the next slide. Um, some of these pictures are physical assets. So uh, for example, the physical asset state S. Um, and that is reflected again in the digital twin state D. Yeah? So S is the physical state, D is the digital twin state. And the digital twin state is also informed by some data that are being measured by sensors, uh, the observational data O. One can use the uh, computational models comprising the digital twin to predict quantities of interest. Uh, for example, uh, well, we call them Q. Uh, it's up to the application uh, what you define as a quantity of interest. Uh, Dirk Hartman mentioned also this morning an example with the, with the motor. Uh, in that case, it's often the, the temperature inside the uh, device. And uh, these quantities of interest, they could in fact in turn inform control inputs U influencing the asset state. Okay, so this is the example that they use. It's a, it's a mathematical model of an unmanned aerial vehicle and also its associated digital twin. So there's a very nice picture that they made. Half of the plane is the physical uh, part and the other half is the digital part, just to make things clear. And you see here that, uh, well, on the left-hand side, on, on the right-hand side, there's the physical state S, uh, there is also control inputs U and observational data, for example, measured by, uh, by uh, sensors. And then on the left-hand side, we have the digital twin. Uh, what we calculate is the digital state, and it should probably be similar, of course, to the physical state. Um, you can measure lots of quantities of interest uh, inside the device, which is often not possible in the physical uh, environment. So you can define whatever you like and measure that and calculate that. And then you could also define some kind of reward, which could be the mission success or the fuel burn or whatever. So I think this is a very nice, uh, nice uh, little example. And as I said, you can see this more information uh, in Siam News or in the recent article by Wilcox et al. Okay, come to my conclusion. First, some kind of executive summary of uh, what we discussed. 
Um, when we look at digital twins, what we need to do is to accelerate the development and optimization of industrial processes and devices. And we have to extend current MBSE concept to model-based assistance along the complete life cycle. So not restricted the design phase, but also during operation. And needed for this is high powered multidisciplinary effort, bring mathematical MSO methods together with techniques for the treatment of big data and AI methods, and also with high performance computing. In other words, making these methods efficient in modern hardware environments. Now, Europe is quite strong uh, traditionally in mathematics, and uh, there's lots of uh, software companies uh, in, in, uh, in Europe. So that, that's not the problem. And there are lots of opportunities. I mean, uh, much more is possible when we would pay a major and concerted effort to bridge the gap yeah, and to unite the strengths of European mathematicians with the industry 4.0 that uh, I mentioned this morning. And uh, there are lots of new business interactions if we succeed in, in, uh, in this uh, digital twinning. From a mathematical point of view, um, in developing these digital twins, I hope I showed you that there are many mathematical challenges and that uh, we have to work on this. A few years ago, we uh, thought that maybe the mathematics or the numerical mathematics needed for simulations is finished and that uh, most of the methods are done. But now with the advent of the new uh, things like AI, high performance computing, data science, a whole new world of uh, possibilities has opened, and this also leads to many new challenges. This makes it really an exciting field of research. I mean, we have to combine our traditional methods or invent new methods, combine them with data science, artificial intelligence, high performance computing, and really make sure that we have advanced simulation techniques that are ready for the future. Uh, model order reduction is important. Also, the solution of large linear systems and nonlinear systems is important uh, in order to achieve real time or even beyond real time simulations. And that's exactly what is needed for digital twinning. And uh, so, the main conclusion is that digital twins need advanced and novel mathematical assets. And we need to develop these in close collaboration with the engineers in industry and also scientists in other disciplines, depending on, uh, I mean, for example, this morning, we talked about digital twins for health and uh, or in the life sciences. And so we also have to work with scientists in other disciplines, not only with the engineers in industry. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Viol, for this uh, inspiring uh, presentation. and. Uh, this was uh, this is very very interesting and uh, we got a chance to um, understand um, uh, in detail different aspects that uh, the mathematicians um, and problems that math mathematicians can where mathematicians can can uh, play a key role and uh, thank you for highlighting that. Um, so we have a space for uh, questions. Uh, anyone wants to uh, ask a question? I see the hand of Jeffrey. Yeah. Uh, Jeffrey, thank you. Uh, yes. well, it, it's, it's my, <laughs> thank you for it, it, It's my role. I'm, I'm running a digital twin here that's coming, oh, up, yes. with, coming up with questions. <laughs> um, so thank you for a, a very interesting and stimulating presentation. I wanted to ask you about something that you, you didn't speak about, but no reason why you should have done, mm -hmm. which is how to, how to develop the, or what is needed to be able to put a trained workforce to take on this huge challenge that exists there. Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think, I mean, this, 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 me, I mean, so uh, to give an example, I mean, in the Netherlands, we have the, uh, the possibility to, uh, to uh, submit uh, huge project proposals uh, that uh, were for 25 million, say. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think uh, this is what we did. And uh, I think that's the way to generate the workforce. I mean, what we did was we have mathematicians working with physicists, astronomers, and uh, people in the life sciences. And 
this is one way of doing this, of course. But indeed, and the other thing is, uh, especially in fact, today, we also suggested a new center in the Netherlands, uh, center, uh, well, concentrating on AI for science and engineering. And I think combining all these, uh, well, you need a big thing. Yeah, that, that you're right. I mean, mm -hmm. so it's it's not simple to do this in a, in a, in a research group or, I mean, you really have to join forces and bring people together. And uh, you need these large initiatives to do this. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, uh, Jeffrey uh, mentioned also about training the, the human resources and the students, uh, because, for instance, in, in Portugal, we can see that our um, bachelor's um, when the student is choosing uh, his bachelor's or even master's, he, mm. he chooses mathematics or engineering. So um, uh, maybe uh, uh, these areas should be uh, work, uh, closed since the very beginning. Uh, so in terms of uh, um, maybe uh, uh, building a new new training courses for the different ages. I don't know because. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I fully agree, uh, Paula and uh, Jeffrey. I mean, uh, when I look at the curriculum in universities, it's often very traditional. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, that if we want to address the problem, I mean, I was talking, for example, about my metric methods. Uh, mm -hmm. I gave a course in Wuppertal uh, this year on my metric methods, but usually it's not in the curriculum. And mm -hmm. uh, I think this is, I mean, there are several of these examples where you would actually like to change the curriculum and, and have special trainings uh, or different uh, training for, for uh, I mean, which are more in line with what industry and science needs nowadays. Yeah, yeah. of course, of course, the basis, mm -hmm. I mean, that's always the argument. You need a certain basis in mathematics if we restrict ourselves to mathematics mm -hmm. to, 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 yeah, to, to build, ma to, to have mathematicians. But I mean, you should also prepare them for, for, the, for the practice. I mean, uh, where they will be working. And in the past, maybe, mathematicians would, uh, people that studied mathematics would stay in university. Nowadays, you see that 90% goes to industry. Mm -hmm. So and we have to prepare them for this. Yeah. Yes. So do you not think we've reached a point where, sorry, thank you for Paula for reinterpreting my uh, question. Do you not think we've reached a, a point where the, the development of education that we've been following for uh, hundreds of years, um, and which we've all been recipient of, which mm -hmm. is to build up uh, a, a, a sort of layer by layer sort of approach to, to learning and education, mm -hmm. such that only the people who get to the very top level then learn about, oh, there's, ex there's exciting things such as digital twins, additive mm -hmm. manufacturing, uh, uh, personalized medicines, all of these different things and yeah. that we, we need to we need to restructure so that we give away we turn some of these this building blocks that we need to put in place mm -hmm. we we give over to the lifelong learning part of our lives mm -hmm. and we incorporate into uh, the education process that young people experience or old people experience um which gives them which are uh i think i maybe not necessarily the lecture course that you were thinking of but more the inspirational lectures which mm -hmm. would allow somebody to think ah i wondered what i was going to do with my mathematics degree now i know there's yeah. this world mm -hmm. of this and so they're motivated to do it whereas i think one of the one of the observations that we can make about education is when you're five, you're very excited and you have a huge amount of imagination. Yeah. When you get to 21, if you're lucky, mm -hmm. you may have a little bit of imagination and you may have a little bit of excitement left, but most of it's been driven out of you yeah. and mm -hmm. the system in order to fill you up with all of this sort of necessary, but rather uninspiring information yeah. I think. yeah i agree i agree and uh, we should discuss this and we are discussing this but i mean it's a difficult discussion because uh, people stick to the traditional uh, values yes. often yes. yeah i mean yeah yeah 
And so I, I, to conclude, I just had that uh, uh, we need to take the, this opportunity uh, now that uh, Will mentioned and uh, that uh, show that uh, mathematics is a, 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 a very uh, hot topic uh, right, uh, right now. And so we need to share these with uh, our leaders and our and uh, companies as well in order to uh, take the most of uh, of this opportunity to uh, to to uh, highlight importance of having uh, mathematicians in their in, in uh, research and uh, in the company's teams yeah i i, I always say, i mean uh, i mean often what i observe is that mathematicians are really the final people to be asked or maybe they are not even asked to join a team and i think it's good if a, if a multidisciplinary team also has a mathematician on board or a few yeah, yeah. i think i think we can always contribute very nice things uh, that's true um uh, thank you once again Vil, for your uh, participation uh, and for your collaboration uh, with us uh, we are now moving on to our next uh, speaker. Um, let's last applause to Vil. <laughs> and uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Patrick uh, uh, from Limerick Institution, Institute of Technology in Ireland for joining us. Um, so uh, Patrick will uh, talk about an approach to verification and validation of a digital twin for an industrial use case. Uh, Jeffrey, I don't know if you wanted to um, introduce in more detail uh, this collaboration with Patrick, um, as you wish. Well, well, I think I would only underline that this forms part of the RUN EU university network that we all belong to, so we're all colleagues. And maybe when we were just talking about having something big that we'll talk about, maybe we already have it, we just don't realise it. And maybe this is a, a way forward. Thank you. So, Patrick, please yeah. get started. Thank okay. Uh, thanks, Paula, and thanks, Jeffrey, for um, in inviting me and, and allowing me to speak here today to you. Um, so, uh, my name is Patrick Ruan. I, I'm um, I'm studying uh, doing a PhD in the Limerick Institute of Technology soon to be renamed the uh, Techno Technological University of the Shannon um, at the end of the month. And uh, my paper title um, for this talk is an approach to the verification and validation of a digital twin for industrial use case. Um, can everybody see my screen before I keep going on? Yes. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, a little bit about, about myself. Um, so I, I, I currently work in Johnson & Johnson. Um, it's uh, Johnson & Johnson Vision Care. It's a subsidiary of uh, Johnson & Johnson, uh, which is the largest healthcare company in the world. Um, and uh, our division, we manufacture contact lenses. And uh, we have two, two, two sites, one in Limerick and a uh, second site, which is the, uh, the headquarters of JJVC in Florida in the US. Um, my role is a special projects director with uh, Johnson Johnson Vision Care, and um, I have, my background is in mechanical engineering. And I'm a design director for responsible for the development of um, new technologies for the manufacture of contact lenses. Um, a, a little bit, a little bit on some of the products that you may be aware: um, one day Acuvue, Acuvue Moist, Acuvue Oasis. So these are all disposable contact lenses, and um, they are classified as a medical device. So there's very stringent controls and procedures and uh, strict validation guidelines for the manufacture of these products. Um, a little bit on the, on the equipment is uh, that we have uh, both in Ireland and, and, and the US. Um, so there are fully automated manufacturing equipment. Um, and that equipment, uh, the, the product, the raw materials are automatically fed into the line and product comes off the, the end of the line, cartoned, case packed uh, onto a pallet. And as between those two points from the start to the end, it's, it's not touched by anybody. 
by any person's hands. Um, it's fully automated. And some of the technologies we have there, injection motor machines, dosing systems, a lot of robotics, synchronous motor technology, sterilization, packaging, et cetera. And obviously then the control systems that go with it. <clears throat> very expensive lines um, in excess of $30 million each. So very complex, very integrated, very expensive. Um, and the reason for my research is in developing simulation techniques and um, a methodology and a framework that um, we and other manufacturers with, with automated equipment can use to help in the design of that equipment and reduce the lead time in designing equipment like this. Because um, this type of equipment, when we're designing it, it can take up to 12 to 18 months to design design only um, and then you get into the build and install and start up so it's a very you know it's a very um, long process for developing new technologies a um, little bit on digital twin and i know we've heard a lot here today um, but from from our perspective um, in terms of equipment um, overall oee which is overall equipment efficiency um, in manufacturing is very important and that's a measure of how how good the equipment is running. And it takes into account reliability, cycle time, and quality. Um, and it, it's, it's a measure of those three um, parameters together. And the goal of you know, a lot of, uh, all of manufacturing organizations is to maximize that um, value, that OE value. And it's, it's, it's how well the equipment is performing based on its absolute maximum and its theoretical capability. Um, a little bit on, on digital twins. Um, back in the 60s, simulation was, was very limited to um, particular topics uh, to simulate example mechanics of a, a particular device. And then it moved on then to various simulation tools in the 80s um, and simulating fluid dynamics and systems like that. Um, then into 2000s, which is simulation-based um, system design. So you are simulating systems. And now we're into the digital twin. Another way of, of showing it is a, a digital model is where you simulate um, a system and there's no automated data exchange either back or forth to the, uh, from the physical system to the digital system. A digital shadow is um, you have automated one-way transfer of data, i.e. from the physical to the digital. And then a digital twin then is uh, data flowing back and forth between the physical and the digital. Um, discrete event simulation, and that's um, the industrial use case that I use, uh, have, have, have worked on. Um, I'm using discrete event simulation. A little bit on that is it's, it's a study of a working system as it evolves over time. Um, it, um, it, you, you, um, it, it answers various questions about real systems and it um, simulates discrete events over time. Um, the, each event that occurs at a particular time um, is simulated. I've been gone again there. Um, and where we use simulation is in, you may have heard, it, is in a DMAIC type approach. So you define what the problem is, measure it, analyze, improve, and control. And you know what, what I have done is using simulation to analyze a particular system and also use simulation to improve and recommend um, an optimized um, solution or an optimized um, set of conditions to run a piece of equipment. Um, a little bit, just a um, uh, high level overview on discrete event simulation flow. So you have event one, you're simulating that, and then you go to event two, the event three, event N. And what discrete event simulation does is it, it simulates each of these events at a particular point in time. 
a um, little bit on um, the industrial use case. And um, what I've done here is um, a block diagram of the industrial use case that I'm that I'm that I'm analysing. Um, it's a piece of equipment within um, our our business um, for manufacturing contact lenses. And um, the, the the start here is a product feeder. And um, basically, this system is a robot taking parts off a vehicle and loading them onto a conveyor. We then group that product into groups of 10. We load it into a tray, a plastic tray. And those trays are stacked together. Um, those trays then, two stacks of trays then are entered into what I call a process station one. And that's basically a sterilization process. That's a batch sterilization process. Um, they come out of that sterilization process. They're unstacked. So the trays are taken off one at a time. Then we go to process station three, which we, we dry any moisture off the product. We unload, um, we unload the trays, we unload the product out of the trays with the robot. We group the product into 30s. We pack it off into cartons. We, we then take the cartons and we put it into a case packer. And, and finally, we're left with the finished product. So that's a high level overview of the system. And as you can see from some of the, the, um, the, the pictures I've put in here, um, it's, 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 it's a complex piece of equipment and it's fully integrated. So I'm just showing snippets of the main process stations, um, but you can imagine that this thing is um, fully integrated, connected, running 24 seven. And uh, lastly, then is an empty buffer, empty tray buffer. So we have the empty trays that come off the tray loader. We have a buffer of those ready to get reloaded here in the tray loader again. The I developed um, simulation um, model or digital model of the whole system, broke it out into three different phases and using um, JamSim, which is a, a, a simulation package. Um, and you can see here, it's of a similar type of flow to the, the block diagram that I just previously described. Um, also in here then, um, I put in the downtime entities. So each of these various stations have a cycle time and a downtime. And those, these are the downtime entities. And in, within each of these objects, there is uh, parameters um, for the downtime for, the, for the, that particular station. Likewise here, there is, um, and I'll get onto it in, in a couple of slides later, is the distribution of the downtime. So, you know, a particular station might have a mean time between failure and a mean time to repair. And that mean time between failures may follow a particular distribution. Um, so I've configured the system that, you know, you it can either be an exponential distribution or a normal distribution for the duration of the downtime. Um, and then the, the time to, uh, that's for the, the duration of the downtime, which is the time to repair. And between failures is, it can be exponential or normal. And I'll get into these in a little bit more detail later on. That just give you a high level overview. Just a, a zoomed in um, view of phase one. Uh, you can see here the product is fed in, grouped, tray, load, tray packed, tray is loaded into trays, lifted up and then moves on to stage two. And then the empty trays are coming back down here, ready to get loaded again. Um, in so there's a, lot, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of work on into developing the, the digital model. Um, and it's critically important then that that digital model is verified and validated so that any, um, any results or any decisions that come out of that model, it's, it's, you can rely on them and 
they can be used for further analysis and further design work on the system or on the actual equipment. So first step is to verify that the, the actual digital model is, um, is correct. And model verification process. Um, so I developed a model verification process. And that was basically, first step is to verify the logical and mathematical verification um, are correct. So any algorithms and rules and assumptions are checked that I, I've put into the digital model are, are checked and verified that they, they're, they're correct and represent what the actual system is doing. Um, program verification. So any units, quantities, bugs, decisions, condition checks are all verified and make sure that they're all correct within the model. Um, a visual observation check on the model running. So as that model that I just showed um, is, is running, um, you know, this step is visually observing that what you're seeing, what, what is actually happening in the model represents what's, what the live system and the physical system is actually doing. The last step then is verification of code and settings and parameters. Um, so I put together a table then of all the various objects, what they are, some of the settings, um, so the, inter, the, the arrival times, the travel times, the entities per arrival, the queuing, um, and all the uh, condition checks, and, and verified that each one of those within the model is correct. So that was a, a, an initial step in uh, verifying that the, the, the base model is correct. The next step then is getting on to um, the validation of the model. Um, and how I validated the model is um, based on data from the actual trail, order, trail, trail loading system. So we, we, we calc, we, collect a lot of data from the, from the actual system using factory talk and historian database. And it's taken that data, analyzing that data and feeding that data back into the simulation model. An example of that is um, the input parameters. So some of the input parameters into the model is, for example, is the P feeder rate. Um, the yield, the P-feeder yield. And then we get into, for all of the various stations, what the mean time between failure, and what the mean time to repair, what the distributions are, and what the parameters of those distributions are. And what I found was, um, based on analyzing the data, and I'll, I'll show some of this, how, how I did it, uh, the, the rate follows the Johnson transformation. I'll talk a little bit about that one. The yield was in the Weibull distribution, and the mean time between failure and mean time to repair followed the exponential distributions. And that data then is fed back into the, um, the digital model, and the results then of the digital model is then compared to the actual results um, using a two-sample t-test. And finally, then I've shown that the simulation model has a prediction error of approximately 0.2%. Or a, a prediction error, sorry, a prediction error of 0.2%. So a little bit on the, um, so I'm not sure, can you see the top of the screen? If I move that out of the way. Yes. So the P-feeder entities per arrival. So um, it's critically important that the the input parameters and the, the, the rate at which product is fed into the simulation model is correct. Um, and I do that by it's E as the entities per arrival is based on the rate and it's based on the yield. And those two parameters I calculate uh, on the next couple of slides. Um, the, the, first, the first step is calculate the rate. So taking the, the, um, the rate from the actual line over 309 uh, shifts, and the shift is 12 hours. So it's, 
you know, in around 150 days of data. The I'm plotting it on uh, using Minitab. Uh, the mean is 8.9 units per second, and a standard deviation of 1.4. Any outliers were removed if there was major downtime on the line or uh, the line was down for um, a preventative maintenance day and that type of stuff. So they were they, those outliers were, were removed. And the data then was plotted. And we can see the data up here is plotted, but it doesn't follow a normal distribution. Once I transform that into a Johnson transformation, um, you can see then that it, it's, it's almost a straight line. And it um, has a best p-value of 0.76 which is greater than 0 0.05. And plotting it down here, the transformed data, we can see it follows a normal distribution. And the transformation equation then is this equation here. And on the next slide, um, so it's a little bit on the different Johnson transformations of three types, but the, the type that I, I, I use for uh, in, that represents my data is the SB, which is the bounded type. And the equation then is the, the SB number is point, minus 0 0.168 plus all of this here, the log X, mi X minus uh, 2.29 over 15.1 minus X. And X is the process variable. And what I do then is I set up the simulation, uh, an object within my sim digital model um, to give me values of SB between um, with a mean of 0 0.0199 and a standard deviation of 1.01. .01. So when I request the object within the simulation model to give me a value, it will give me a value um, from um, a normal distribution with a mean of 0 0.019 and standard deviation of 1.01. .01. I take that value and I plug it back into this equation and that gives me my P feeder rate. I do a similar exercise then for the yield. Um, so I, I took the data from the actual line, uh, plotted that. It followed um, a three parameter Y build distribution with a shape factor of 13.19, a scale of 0 0.3671, threshold, and this was the number of samples. Um, and I create an object then within the simulation. Um, model, the digital model, with and it follows a Weibull distribution with these parameters. So every time I request a value from that object, um, it will fall on into this uh, distribution. Uh, Patrick. Yes. Yeah. In the meanwhile, we need to conclude. Okay. 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 I, I don't have too many more slides. Okay. Thank you. Okay. No, sorry um, to interrupt. Okay. Um, so a similar detailed process is completed for other uh, critical model inputs. Um, I did a similar thing then for to, to determine the mean time between failure and mean time to repair and followed the exponential distributions. I did that for all the various stations. Um, then used a two sample t-test. So, so then um, ran the simulation model and um, the output from the simulation model was compared to the output from the actual system. And I compared the means and standard deviations and shown that the, the means um, were statistically uh, very similar, both the standard deviation and the mean, and did that for the actual throughput from the system and the reliability from the various stations. And um, the, so the simulation data and the actual line data are not statistically different with a prediction error of 0.2%. Um, that's it. Mm -hmm. So any, any questions? Thank you, Patrick, for uh, showing us the work that you've been developing um, in uh, Johnson & Johnson. Um, we are now, we have space for one question. Okay. Anyone? Can yes, I? Can I can, yes. Yeah, just just uh, not not a technical question, but do you have contacts with uh, Maxi in Limerick, the Mathematics uh, Applications uh, Consortium for Science and Industry? 
Um, are they based in the University of Limerick? Yes. Yeah, I I have heard of them. Um, I have I have not been in contact with them. Oh yeah, okay. The, the, because they they have a very large well, they have a large network contacts with industry, but uh, would be uh, well, you're so close. <laughs> okay. Yes. 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 That's a, a good suggestion there. Okay. Um... Any other question or comment? Yeah. Yes, Jeffrey. 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 Oh, yes. Paul. Paul. Okay. Jeffrey and Paul. No, Very Paul. quick questions. Paul. Paul, please. Okay. Sorry. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, I've used Jamson before, and I was just wondering have you tried to automate the connection from your data into the model? And have you had any trouble with that? Um, I, I have not done that yet. I, I, I do know it has the capability to. Um, take data in automatically. Um, wh what I do is I, I set up um, uh, an Excel CSV file and I put the parameters into that. And then the, I run the simulation, um, uh, the JAM sim simulation model, and that pulls the data directly from the CSV file into the JAM sim. And the output from the JAMSIM is then I write it to a CSV, CSV file also. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Jeffrey, you wanted to. Yes. yes. I was thinking when you were going through the detailed description of each of the steps, whether this was uh, something that's that's programmed. In other words, if you if somebody comes up with a another a way of treating the 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 contact lens surface so it doesn't <coughs> do something to the eye or or protects from the atmosphere how easy is it to incorporate changes in there in other words is your is your sort of uh, description hardwired or is it is it is it sort of programmed yeah what i would say is um if if somebody Develop, say, a new station, a new process, yes. um, to put that back in. So it's not a, it's not an automatic thing. You would put it back into the that it would get back into the um, simulation model, but it, it's not so difficult to add that back in, and to add the the parameters um, back into the model. So it, it's not automatic, but it's not it's not so difficult either. Yes. No. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Once again, a uh, big applause to Patrick. Thank you for participating in this uh, event. Uh, we are now moving on uh, our next uh, speaker, uh, Jeffrey Mitchell uh, from the Polytechnic of Lidia. He's going to talk uh, about the multi-scale data to drive, in, to drive digital twins of 3D printing and injection molding of plastics. Thank you, Jeff, Jeffrey, for your collaboration in this event. Mm -hmm. Okay, just trying to find the screen. Okay. Hey, you can see it all okay? Yeah, so yes. we, we, we are seeing uh, um, maybe you should uh, uh, pass to the... Yeah, I'm just trying to, to remember how to do, to do that. Yeah, maybe... You just have to switch um, screens, basically. Oh, 
Oh. Um, display settings. On the yes, top. Display settings in the in the top of top, your top your left, 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 left. Uh, there are display settings and then swap screens. Swap okay. present. So, yeah, swap yeah, there. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much for your help <laughs> in, 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 in guiding one who's hanging on to a technology by their fingernails. Um, so thank you very much, Paola. Thank you for allowing me to present this work um, from the Centre for Rapid and Sustainable Product Development and with contributions from Artur Mateus, Andre Costa, Daniel Silva, uh, Paola and myself. So the Center for Rapid and Sustainable Product Development is a center of excellence in the field of direct digital manufacturing. Uh, this photograph shows the, the purpose uh, built uh, structure that we occupy. And you can see that we're established in the in an industrial zone, we're surrounded by uh, small companies that manufacture things, and that's part of our mission: is adding value to these companies so that we can manufacture a better future. Um, so, just a very quick word about direct digital manufacturing: taking a digital representation using one of a whole number of different technologies to produce a product without using specialized tooling or without using molds and to produce products. And these, these products can have very wide range of application. The inset shows the prime minister Antonio Costa um, when he opened the building and he's uh, holding up a symbol of the Polytechnic of Lyria, which was actually produced at CDSP using selective laser melting. Right. So on to a summary of the presentation. So you can see there's four main blocks to it, thinking about digital twins, thinking about multi-scale properties, thinking about the structure we envisage for the digital twin, and then going on to summarize. Well, we've heard a lot about digital twins, so I don't need to dwell on this very quickly. But to emphasize one or two things, we've heard several times the phrase data-rich data systems. Well, of course, not everything is data-rich. And this is, perhaps this is an area where we're not so data-rich. Um, but of course, it's a two-way process. So that the, 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 the virtual send information to the uh, the real system and the real system to the virtual system. Uh, and so I think that's an important part of the process. Now, of course, when we're thinking about a digital twin system, we need to think about how to handle the multi-scale structures or phenomena or properties or behavior that exist in this digital twin. So in the example that we heard about this morning about uh, uh, heating, uh, the electric motor heating, then we didn't, we didn't worry about electrons. We didn't worry about vibrating atoms. Well, we didn't worry about anything because we were just listening, but we, we saw that it was possible to using a particular simulation to predict the, the model. And so we need to think about what scales are important to include. And so in some systems, of course, such it's insignificant, what might be seen quite insignificant features in the structure or in the product may have a big impact upon its lifetime, on how it degrades, how it behaves during service, etc. But of course, for many, we can just reduce down to the simple scale. So if we, for example, we're going to talk about injection molding and 3D printing, if we think about opening a gate in an injection molding 